9.30. Salam alaikum, everyone. Quick announcement. The conference will be commencing in five minutes. Can I ask that uh, everyone make their way upstairs to the conference room? The conference will be beginning in five minutes. Thank you.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته التيبين الطاهرين المعصومين Brothers, sisters, respected elders, scholars and dignitaries, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the second day of the International Center for Advanced Islamic Researchers annual international conference on the theme of God in the modern world here in the Jaffrey Community Center, Toronto. Uh, yesterday we had a, a really excellent program. Uh, we covered a lot of topics, and today we are aiming to build on, on those topics with some brilliant panels on God and society, theism and atheism, paths and paths to God. But before that, in this session, in a moment, we're going to have Quran recitation, followed by a special address by the President of the World Federation, Al-Hajj Safdar Jafar. And then we are going to have a special keynote address uh, delivered by video by Ayatollah Jawadi Amali. May God preserve him. But to begin proceedings, let us begin with the words of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala in his Revelation, the Holy Quran, recited by our dear brother, Mohsin Abbas. Please welcome Mohsin Abbas to the podium with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإلّا الملك السماء والله على كل شيء قدير إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لا Subhanak 
سبحانك سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار ربنا وما للظالمين من أنصار ربنا إنك من تدخل النار فقد أخزيته وما ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد صدق الله علي عظيم In the spirit of this beautiful gathering today, bringing together people of all walks of life on this land, now known as Canada, we would like to begin today's program with a land acknowledgement. Participating in a land acknowledgement is an act of respect and reconciliation, expressing our deep appreciation to the First Nations people for protecting and being stewards of the land. We respectfully acknowledge that the city of Vaughan is situated in the territory and treaty 13 lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We also recognize the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee the city of Vaughan is currently home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people today. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work and live in this territory. Wassalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Thank you, Brother Mohsen Abbas, for that beautiful recitation from the Holy Quran and for that uh, thoughtful and respectful land acknowledgement. Please can we express our appreciation for our dear Brother Mohsen with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, to open today's proceedings, uh, we have a very, a very special guest, my boss. Um, you know, when I first met uh, the president of WF, uh, Al-Hajj Safta Jafar, I was struck by how much he cared about the work we do at ICARE. He was instrumental. Uh, he was actually uh, the, the real founder of the International Center for Advanced Islamic Research. It was uh, him who sort of pushed forward this idea that we needed an academic research center to address the intellectual and spiritual challenges facing the community today. And from the moment I met him, I could see this was a project that was very dear to his heart. His, uh, his enthusiasm is, believe me when I say this, it is infectious. Uh, and since our inception, he has been, uh, he is, wherever he is in the world, he has always been ready to lend his support to eye care, his guidance, his perspective, and, uh, and to help us overcome any challenges we're facing. Um, I don't think that we could ask for a better champion for the work that we do, and someone that is deeply interested in, in scholarship and the Shia tradition as, as he is to, you know, to, to oversee our work. Um, he's been instrumental at every stage in the process. He's the chairman of our board of directors. And not only that, this is someone who cares deeply about how scholarship reaches the community. And so I think I've, I've already said too much. I'd like to invite Hajj Safta up to the podium so he can share his vision for eye care with all of you. So please welcome him, and remember he's my boss, with an extremely loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa bihi nasta'in wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ahli baytihi al-tahirin Respected scholars the president of ISIJ Toronto and the management committee mu'minin and mu'minat salamun alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Sheikh Alexander, I'm not too sure whether the boss is excited about the introduction. <laughs> Suffice to say that you have put too much pressure on me in the presence of esteemed scholars who fully appreciate our objectives. But thank you very much. We appreciate your enthusiasm and support throughout the journey. Jazakumullah. And I'll come to the vote of thanks at the end of my speech for all those who have been supportive in this process. My role really was to welcome you yesterday, and I was allotted 10 minutes. But as they say, with every difficulty, there is opportunity. Yusra. So because of my flight delays and the challenges we have had in the Middle East, both in terms of the crisis and the weather, I got delayed. But the blessing was, alhamdulillah, the sort of 10 minutes, I have been allotted 20 minutes. So jazakallah for that. It just gives me an opportunity to give a little more flavor about eye care and some of the advices that we have received from His Eminence Sayyid Ali Husseini Assistani Hafizahullah directly as we establish this institution under his guidance. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to really acknowledge the presence of many scholars. And we are really delighted and thankful to each and every scholar and from the academia as well, who have been here with us over the last two days and have made a tremendous effort in presenting their papers. And there was quite a bit of feedback I personally got yesterday from many members here in terms of how to improve and enhance our conferences. There was a critical suggestion that we should enhance the interaction for there have been very limited Q&As. These are some of the subjects are pretty heavy to digest. And the challenge always is that when you are at a khawas level, at a very specialist level, 
And then we as laymen are at a different wavelength. How do you bring that wavelength closer to each other? Raising the academic bar, but at the same time making sure that the very stakeholders, our community, the Mominin, who have registered in high numbers also benefit. There have been many suggestions and I would welcome many more ideas so that we can only improve and enhance. One of them that has come out is more interaction with participants, be it through uh, side sessions or through Q&A, so on and so forth. But for those who have found it difficult yesterday, I would say the hadith of the Prophet is beautiful. To look at the alim itself is an act of worship. And it is not only one alim, alhamdulillah, there is a galore of ulama, and you will at a minimum get the sawab, inshallah ta'ala. I just want to introduce IK to you from a slightly different perspective, and for that I would request the AV team, okay, they already have put the mission and the vision statement of IK. The madrasa that provides education to more than 16,000 of our children globally through Tarbiya curriculum is not enough. We know that. We have an online house with over 180 students. It's still not enough. There is adult education that we'll talk about that is one of the objectives that we want to carry out, inshallah, if Allah grants us the opportunity for the next term, the tawfiq. That is an important area. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. We don't have that modus operandi within the community. Of course, we have the majalis. But majalis, there is a different crowd. You've got kids, you've got elders, you've got different denominations, and how do you address some of the challenges from the majlis always is a challenge. So ICAR has been established to provide a platform to discuss the undiscussable. At times, issues and challenges that we may not be able to either digest from the member, because as Tani has given us guidelines of the member, I'll talk about later. But this platform provides us, provides us an opportunity to discuss some of the subjects which have openly been discussed, and I can already see people have not agreed with many, some of the things that our speakers have said yesterday, but this is an opportunity because it is in a safe environment. By safe environment, I believe we have competent, capable scholars here in our presence. So the mission statement is what the objective of the institution is, the present activities, and why do we exist? to address the intellectual and spiritual challenges facing the koja. And you will see the word koja has been explicitly mentioned. You may ask why, and I'll talk about it. And the global Shia ethnic community by combining traditional scholarship and innovative research and to promote the study of Shiaism globally. The reason the word koja is highlighted here, and it was a, there was a debate because we are part of the mainstream Shia community, and I care is to serve the entire Shia community. And alhamdulillah, the scholars who are here come from different communities within the Shia world. But the reason we identified Kocha is that we are only 135,000 globally as a community, as an ethnicity. And we are an endangered species in the sense that we have a history of conversion from Ismailism or from a distorted version of Islam where we believed in the reincarnation of God through Amir al muminin and in the 1870s, it was the elders of our community that were guided to the path of the Ahlul Bayt. So we only have a history of 150 years, which is not much. And when various ideologies creep into the community, there is a potential of existential threat and divisions that are not conducive to our progress. But on the other hand, it gives us the opportunity of learning and understanding the very faith we inherited the very faith for which our elders gave their lives in a more profound and solid manner. And we know, for those who don't know our journey, I'll just take a minute and you can read various books, one of them being The Endangered Species, published here by Mark, Mula Asghar Research Center in Toronto. The book is available, where you will look at some of the historical aspects of how we converted. And we converted through the barakah of the Ahlul Bayt and particularly Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And it was Sheikh Zainul Abidin Mozandaran. The Marja in the 1870s, when a group of Zuvar went to Karbala to perform this yara, and when they were guided to the door of Sheikh Zainul Abidin, the Mujtahid, the Marja at that time, and when he came to know that this community has a distorted version of Shiaism or of our faith, he sent Abu Balik, who was training under him, Mullah Qadir Sen Karbalai, from Mumbai to go back to Mumbai and 
support the community to understand this faith. Thereafter, it's all history. And we chose as a community to move and to adhere to the path of the Ahlul Bayt, Salamullah Ajma'in. And that continues till today. But we face many challenges, as you all know. We are spread out in six continents, in the East and the West, more than 150 Jamaats globally. And the challenge is that how do we preserve our faith in a way that we can preserve and have those defenses around us so that with all the changes in the world that we see, we can continue to prosper and understand our faith better. In 2003, the World Federation embarked upon a program to produce Muballiks through a program that was established in Sham, Muballik Training Program, MTP, endorsed by the Executive Council of the World Federation. The Hausa was established in Sham. And for whatever reasons, and I don't want to go into the history, this project got disbanded. There was also a political crisis that unfolded. There was a war, and the Hausa got disbanded. But the mistake we made as a community was we did not have a plan B, resulting in fragmentation, in giving direction to the community in terms of seeking Islamic knowledge for those who want to be mubalighin and who want to go and preach out there, who necessarily don't want to go through the path of uh, bahs kharij and beyond, but to have solid foundations, eight, ten years of studies and come forward. Alhamdulillah, of course, we were fortunate that we, the World Federation through MTP, produced four graduates who are all, alhamdulillah, mubalighin Mubalig and mubalighi who are preaching today, and one of them, of course, Sheikh Ja'far Ja'far, the resident alim of uh, Brampton Jamaat, who has been serving this community for many, many years, is a, one of the product of this Hausa. The one area where we had a quick win, or rather I would say there was a concerted effort with 10 years of investments where we spent quite a bit of resources is the Madrasa Center of Excellence, the Tarbiya curriculum. 10 years of the journey, alhamdulillah ta'ala, we have more than 16,000 kids studying Tarbiya with more than 2,000 teachers in Toronto being prominent. And particularly after the challenges you had here with the East and the West Madrasa and the the wider communities out there, this curriculum became an impetus to converge and have the entire community following one curriculum under the supervision of Sayyid Muhammad Rizwi, who, has, who remains the scholar on the board of the Madrasa Center of Excellence. There are other many challenges we face. And let me make it clear that the relationship and social education aspect is already being piloted in Toronto through Madrasa Center of Excellence, where kids are exposed to education and requirements of the state that sometimes we feel are incomprehensible with our faith, that aspect of RSE is in progress. You as a community in Toronto have been extremely supportive to us and we are very grateful for that, but that is only a journey. The Islamic schools, the need of full-time schools with ethos is lacking. We have 15 schools globally, but I can say that there are only two or three schools that actually adhere to the Islamic ethos. One of them, of course, is your own school here, Al-Sadiq again under the patronage of Molana Rizvi, and of course a board of directors that's very cognizant, and we had a meeting with them last night. And I know that there are also other schools like Walil Asar and the Selm Academy, and we will be very much engaging with them with the hope that we can strengthen the schools that we, existing schools we have, and provide the schools in places like France where even hijab is banned where our girls have to remove their hijab to go to school, and there is no solution that has been provided to the community to date. So we have a responsibility as leadership because we are part and parcel of the process where we have not yet provided an alternative. And again, we seek collaboration with ISIJ in Toronto and Al Saadi School and others in the field of education, including homeschooling that is very successful, I believe, in Toronto. Of course, the online Hausa is there, and, and, uh, and the other aspects uh, of, uh, of that can be discussed later. But we know for a fact that Madrasa alone is not enough. Our kids are exposed to major challenges, and we know that. The dominant cultural clash between Islamic values and, our, and, the, and, the, and the principles of the Western and the modern world, compounded by the fact that Shia youths are the minority. So on one hand, you have the identity crisis, compounded by the fact that you are a minority within the Islamophobia and the negative stereotypes out there, there is a crave to get proper education. The advancement of technology and the social media and artificial intelligence was discussed yesterday, and we heard that. 
Another area, and I visit regularly the Jamaats. I've been to more than 55 Jamaats globally, and I continue to so because it gives us a flavor of the challenges in every Jamaat in the East and the West. One thing that I consistently see, and some of the ulama will agree with me, is questioning the authority and leadership. We have taken marja'iyah and taqlid for granted in the sense that we believe in it. Of course, it is a necessity. It is our survival. Our marja is the red line, and we have mentioned that many a times. And even this project of eye care, we have been guided by his evidence, and I'll talk about that shortly. But today's generation, I feel, is struggling to come in terms with authority. We are, in, we are unique in that religious authority and leadership with the concept of imama and wilaya being central to the faith is a fundamental of our belief and in preserving of the unity, the institution of marja'iyah. However, Shia youths are struggling to navigate through this with all the wider challenges I see, and they need that strong foundation and support so they can not only recognize, but from their heart appreciate the importance of this institution of authority. But it is a challenge we need to face and tackle. Cultural influences I have talked about as well. So how are we addressing all these issues? The next slide, if you may go to the next slide, and that summarizes investing in the ulama. We have 200 Koja students studying in the holy city of Qum. I'm very thankful to some here in the audience who have institutes where they are catering for the needs of our Canadian Hausa students, and we really appreciate that tremendous work that is done. There are others also who are fulfilling that need, but there is a craving and there is a need for exposure to the challenges of our time, particularly in the West, because the Hausa students who study for 10 plus years, when they come to do tabligh, they find it very difficult to assimilate. They find it very difficult to relate the challenges to the wider audience. And then we settle for, at times, mediocrity, despite the fact that we have tremendous number of ulama. So that is an area that we are already investing and continue to invest both in the holy city of Qom as well as in Najafi Ashraf where we have acquired a piece of land that has been gifted to us by Atul Ishaq Fayaz where we intend to develop residency for the, 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 the students over there. The research institute, and I'll come back to that, extremely critical for our survival and success, but not only for the Kojas, but for the wider Shia community as part of the West and the East as well. Strengthening our schools and colleges through Islamic ethos, I mentioned that. Enable digital learning, alhamdulillah, the Hausa Online is doing a phenomenal job. We need short courses, Sheikh Mubadri tells me, that's in the pipeline for, to support the adult education process, cradle to the grave. Female scholars, we have a shortage of female scholars. There is a craving for female scholars. I'm happy to see that we have at least four female scholars in this conference, but we need more. There is a dire need, and World Federation is willing to provide support to any female uh, uh, scholar or aspiring scholars who are going to go and study and enhance their uh, understanding. And of course, the MCE being uh, an important one. Now, let me come to eye care. We have had many challenges in the community. Some of them we have been unable to tackle, but the Maraja have always been there to support. Issues on sexuality, issues on feminism, issues on postmodernism, pluralism, issue of wasila, istighasa. The, uh, the infallibility of imma are all being questioned. Even the issue of Tawheed and atheism, there are youths and people who are struggling with that. And that is why this conference, God in the Modern World, is precisely to address the issues starting from the core of our belief, which is Tawheed. So I care is here, number one, to support the Zakirin and the ulama with material so that when you go to the member, you have the ability to deliver something that is robust and viable and understandable to the wider audience, particularly the young people. Support the house of students in preparing, understanding the Western economic methodologies. When they come to the West, they struggle to understand the pedagogies and the hermeneutics and the other sciences that are thriving in this part of the world. Of course, the annual conferences uh, that we hold, the Al-Qalam journal being important, and strategic research, at times data-driven research as well as compounded by actual Islamic research is required. We just established a marriage contract. Toronto is ahead of that. Many communities today, women are suffering. They don't get divorces for 10, 15 years. We have been able to address that now through a marriage contract that has been standardized and globalized. Gender interaction policy. 
Molana Rizvi put this paper 15 years ago that was passed here in Toronto Executive Council, but times have changed. Many changes have been brought up together with consultation of him and many other scholars. We have revamped that in gender interaction policy that is out now and uh, endorsed by the community. We need many other policy papers for the community. AI and artificial intelligence, we clearly saw the debate yesterday with diverse views from our own scholars about the use or the misuse or the approach towards artificial intelligence. These are things that I am hoping that Islamic education in conjunction with eye care under very solid scholars will address. Now, coming to the very important last but not least point is the methodology and the approach that I care will take. Let me start, and again, the scholars, I feel very humble when I bring a hadith because they are in a better position. The famous hadith, Talabul Ilm Faridatun ala kulli Muslimin wa Muslima. Seeking knowledge is obligatory, faridha, on every Muslim, male and female. Wajib. Shahid Asani has authenticated the chain of narration, starting from Samin al Hajjaj Ali ibn Musa Rada, salawatullah salamu alayhi, going back to him, an abaihi, seventh imam, sixth imam, fifth imam, fourth imam, third imam, second imam, Amirul Mumini, and to the Prophet. Annahu qal, the Prophet said, seeking knowledge is obligatory for every male and female. But many a times when we look at this hadith, and I've learned from my teachers that people read half of that hadith, there is a second component of this hadith as well. Where do you seek knowledge from? What are the sources of your knowledge? The context of that knowledge, the speaker, the books. Do we have to be selective or can we accept any type of knowledge coming from any avenue? That is the critical question because there is knowledge is out there fully. That is why when you look at MC curriculum, we call it tarbiyah and not talim. Talim is out there in full abundance to be selective. What are the risks? Imagine the risks if we get knowledge from an incorrect source, from an inappropriate individual. It destroys our iman. I have a practical example from a Hausa student who is a scholar of our community. He discussed this with me seven years ago, that when he was young in Africa, he was convinced by a scholar that there's no need of tawassul. And that you are wasting your time, you go direct to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, I abandoned tawassul. For 10 years, I abandoned tawassul later when Allah gave me the guidance. And I went to the Hawza and I studied the sciences and I understood what tawassul is. And the verses of the Quran hadith, I feel closer to the Ahlul Bayt, but I feel my progression will take me 10 years to get there. I lost the Ahlul Bayt for 10 critical years of my life. This is a practical example. There are many examples out there. So the source of knowledge is essential. In this hadith, the Prophet continues, ilma. Where do you seek knowledge? From what sources? Seek knowledge in its proper places and take it from its people. That is where his eminence has provided very clear guidance to eye care that I would like to share. Remind myself, the board of directors and all of us here, the importance of ensuring that particular component of uh, getting knowledge from its proper places and from the pop, uh, appropriate people. If you go to the next slide, which is the statement of his eminence with respect to eye care. Uh, that's the Farsi version. We go to the next version, which is an English translation. We approached his eminence around five years ago, Sheikh Murtaza Ali Dina, who probably is listening to this session today, will witness. My time is up. Five more minutes, inshallah, I will finish. Um, we went to him because we had a big debate in the community. Community leaders are here. Rizwan Bayez is a president. We have 150 presidents globally. They are not graduated at the Hausa level. Speakers come on the member. And when there is controversy, they come and say, which speaker to invite, which speaker not to invite, what to invite, what not to invite. There are certain very controversial speakers five years ago that came up. We had no choice. We were under constant bombardment that we need guidance. We went to his eminence. We presented a holistic dossier about certain views expressed by certain speakers. And his eminence gave profound intervention in terms of types of speakers. The parents were advised to, uh, to watch out for and to accept or reject. That guidance I'm not going to talk about because the World Federation has produced that guidance explicitly, so Jamaat leaders don't have to be worried. That guidance is out there, it is black and white. 
I won't go through that. But I'll talk about the guidance he gave as far as I care is concerned. Because when we established I care, we went to Agha and we told him that we are establishing this institute to meet the contemporary challenges, to address the challenges of our time, uh, as well as discussing the undiscussable. He said, it's a great idea. Go for it. But take this advice in mind. He prays for the success of their endeavors in elucidating religious truths and dispelling misconception. It has been endorsed. Aga has endorsed this institution. It is emphasized that any research undertaken in this field should adhere to the principles and scholarly standards that, recognize, that are recognized and accepted. Incompatible methods should be avoided. Therefore, it is appropriate to seek guidance of knowledgeable scholars who are well versed in the foundation of Islamic jurisprudence and, uh, and religious teachings. Alimane mutakhassis wa musallat bar mabani fiqhi wa ma'arife islami. These are the Persian words that you saw in the previous statement. People who are well versed, who are well rooted in Islamic knowledge and jurisprudence in particular and religious component. So this is where we are always cognizant that we don't go beyond that boundary to make sure that this institution is fit for purpose. And we know the methodologies of Western academia. Of course, we respect some of the work that is done, and it is not a question of dismissing it. But who better than one individual who spent almost more than 40 years in Western academia issues a very comprehensive and clear statement to say, my lifelong attempt to balance the rational and objective standards of modern secular academia while adhering to the responsibilities and standards of my Akida were in a few but significant instances of failure. As academia is prone to arrogance and airs of intellectual superiority, it was my responsibility to you as my fellow believers to continuously challenge my academic methodologies and conclusions from the lens of my faith and my community. And this time when we met his eminence, it was quite interesting, and a statement will be issued by the World Federation next week in terms of what Aga advises, but he talked about the unity of our community with relevance to ensuring that we are united in our faith as well. Because fragmentation of faith is not only a danger to our future generation, but also to the fragment of our community. Inshallah, I have no doubt that I care will take this responsibility. You are supporting us, the scholars and the leaders of our community. There, is, there are ambitious plans that we will move forward, some of which will be discussed at the conference next month. Sheikh Alexander will provide a comprehensive report on the progress of I care on the 23rd of May, inshallah, in London. And I would like to end by really thanking um, each of you who have participated, the scholars, the ulamas, the participants. But very, very special thanks, really, uh, to JCC. Uh, to Rizwan Bai and his team and the volunteers for the tremendous hospitality that we have received, alhamdulillah ta'ala. Uh, we def definitely look forward to coming back here for future conferences. And my special thanks really uh, to the board of directors of iCare and their support and their guidance, to the ulama, uh, to the speakers, to the participants, and Sheikh Alexander himself, who is extremely enthusiastic, as you know, and they are ambitious plans. I mean, we always put many more demands on him that he should move faster than what he is, but he is moving at a very fast pace. But that is our role at leadership, to provide him the support and make sure that we accelerate. And of course, to your entire team, Alexander, but I wouldn't get the opportunity to talk again to Mehdi, to Zainab, to the Markoms team, to the AV team, Shahid Ali, to the Secretariat, and to all the volunteers who I have not mentioned have been working in front or behind the scenes. Inshallah, may Allah bless you all. Remember us in the du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much for that uh, heartfelt and inspiring address, uh, Hajj Safto. And uh, can we just express our gratitude once again with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And I'd just like to take uh, a, few, a few moments to, to reiterate a really important point that Hajj Safter made right at the end of his talk, which was uh, you know, just, just a, a little note of thanks. We'll do a, a full one at the end, but this conference that you see in front of you, whether you're here with us in Toronto or watching uh, remotely over the internet, uh, everything you see here is the work of a really uh, dedicated team of people. In fact, it's, uh, it's the work of a team of several teams 
you know, who've all been striving for months now to put this together. Of course, we've got the excellent uh, volunteers and uh, organizers at JCC who've provided this venue and just uh, so much, so much support, uh, both in terms of logistics, in terms of food, organization, advice, uh, that really we couldn't have done this without them. And then, you know, in the background as well, we have our excellent Marcoms team who are on several continents at the moment. We have members here in Canada, uh, some in London, some in Dar es Salaam, um, some trying to, you know, trying, to, trying to travel here and getting caught by wars and floods and uh, cancel flight cancellations. Uh, and so there's just so much dedication that's gone into this, and I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that. And of course, we've got you know, our excellent team on the ground here. You see you know, Ali Mati running, running around and making things happen while I, just, uh, I stand up here. And as someone put it the other day, they said, you're very good with the nice words. And I said, thank you, I am good with the nice words. But it's, it's easier to say nice words when there are so many nice people here. Uh, so yeah, I just want to, I, I want to reiterate uh, that acknowledgement of, of all the effort that's gone into producing this conference. Uh, now we move on to the, the next part of our introductory session, which is a, a very special address by really one of, the, one of the leading scholars of today, and that is His Eminence Ayatollah Jawadi Amali. May Allah preserve him and increase his blessings for all of us. Um, I really don't know how to sum up for you the scholarly stature of someone like Ayatollah Jawadi. But safe to know, if, if you've been in the Hausa at any point in the last 20 years, his name comes up in so many different domains, in so many different fields. And, and really, especially in, you know, in, in, in Persian language scholarship as well, he's, he's a towering, a towering figure, and his, his output is truly prolific. What we see in English, there are some of his books that are being translated in English. I know Sheikh Shuja is here, who is championing that and sort of bringing that knowledge to us in the English language uh, through his institutions. Uh, you know, what we see in English is just a, a drop in the ocean. Ayatollah Jawadi is one of those scholars that combines many different fields of learning. So what he is perhaps most well known for is being a great mystic, a great thinker in the field of Islamic mysticism, spirituality, and ethics. He's also a fantastic philosopher. He was actually the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first person to teach Alama Tabatabai's Bidayat al-Hikmah in a, in a formal class. Uh, and not only that, he was the scholar entrusted by the late Ayatollah Khomeini Rahimatullah Alayh to deliver his famous letter to Gorbachev. There are so many stories I could tell you about him, but none of them would do justice to his scholarly credentials. Because in addition to being a great mystic, an outstanding philosopher with a keen mind, he is also I would say one of the greatest mufassirs of the Qur'an that we have seen in the last century. His tafsir tasneem uh, really is a, uh, builds on the work of his teacher, Alama Tabatabai in Tafsir Mizan, and he manages to blend together the Qur'an, the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, salam, and very interestingly, the fruits of the intellect. And when I say intellect, I don't mean sort of just whatever thoughts come into our mind, but I mean the intellect in the sense of al-aql, the theoretical intellect, the philosophical intellect. He brings that, following the line of his teacher, Allah Tawai, he brings that to tafsir. And in the introduction to tafsir, tafsir uh, tasneem, if you read it, he lays out his methodology. It's this very ambitious project showing how, you know, we, we speak about, for example, in the West, we speak about reason and religion. And he says, Ayatollah Jawadi says, this is a mistake. He says, because religion includes reason. When we talk about shara, we think, oh, shara is Quran and hadith, and then reason is off over there. And occasionally we might go to reason and take some things from it, but reason is outside of religion. But in Tafsir Tasneem, he makes the point. He says, this is, this is a mistaken understanding. This is an erroneous understanding. Reason and the fruits of reason are part of religion. And he, he gives a very interesting explanation of this. He says, because reason like the Qur'an and like the Ahlul Bayt, is a guide that God has given us. And if we are receiving guidance from God, then this is part of 
religion. Now, of course, there are conditions that must be met to say that this is from the fruits of reason. But this gives you a, a flavor, just a taste of the keen intellect of this man. And if that wasn't enough, he is also a great jurist. He is also a faqih, a marja taqlid. And so he is really one of those scholars that exemplifies the word jami', comprehensive, in that he is a master in many fields. And we are truly blessed, we are truly blessed that he has kindly recorded and delivered a special video address for us to benefit from in this conference today. And so without any further ado, can I ask you all to join me in expressing our thanks to Ayatollah Jawadi Amali by for his health and continued blessings, reciting a very loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi wa rahmatullahi wa rahim. Alhamdulillahi wa rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala jami'i al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. والعيمة الهداة المهديين بفاطمة الزهراء سلام الله عليها وعليهم أجمعين بهم نتبلى ومن أعدائهم نتبرعوا إلى الله مقدم علماء دانشبران دانشمندان خبرگان والنخبگان محفل را گرامی می داریم و از همه بزرگوارانی که با ایراد مقال یا ارائه مقالت علمی بر وزن این نشست و هنکره و همایش افزوده و می افضایند حق شناسی می کنیم از همه بزرگوارانی که در برگزاری همچه محفله عظیم علمی سعی بلیغ داشتن سپاس گذاریم امیدواریم جامعه اسلامی و انسانی از این گون از محافل بحری علمی و عملی ببرند و دنیا را از جهل علمی و جهالت عملی برهانند جامعه کنونی در این حال که دانشوران و بزرگانی داشته و دارد ممکن است معاز الله به سمتی حرکت کند که جاهلیت عصر گذشته به اون مبتلا بود در جاهلیت دو قده بدقیم بود که بشر را به سطوح بود بود یکی این که نسبت به گذشته در حیرت و تیرگی به سر می بردن و نسبت به آینده در تاریکی مطلق زیرا نمی دانستن گذشته اونا از کجا شروع شده مبدع هستی کیست به چیست عالم چگونه ایجاد شده بر چه محوری می گردن. این درباره گذشته که برای اونها تیره بود نسبت به آینده تاریک مطلق بود زیرا فکر میکردند که با مرگ نابود میشوند و از بین میروند و در عدم هیچ خبری از این و آن نیست بین دو نبش تیرگی و تاریکی مطلق زندگی میکردند این میشد جاهلیت کهن جاهلیت نو هم خدای ناکرده ممکن است کم کم به این سمت حرکت کند که نسبت به گذشته در تیرگی به سر ببرد که نداند گذشته چی بود و روی این تحیر و تیرگی بماند و نسبت به آینده هم معاذ الله خود را معدوم میپندارد که نیست می شود و از بین می رود اسلام به اون معنای جامع که همه ادیان الهی رو اسلام است و اون چرا که رهاورد حضرت ختمی نبوت است که اسلام معنی خاص است این دو 
نمونه الهی آمدن هم گذشته تیه و ما به هم را شفاف و روشن کردن که هیچ ابهامی در گذشته جهان نیست هیچ ابهامی در گذشته انسانیت نیست هیچ ابهامی در گذشته جوامع بشری نیست به مانند آن هم نسبت به آینده شفاف کردن که هیچ تاریکی نیست ظلمت نیست عدم نیست بشر با مرگ نابود نمی شود چه اینکه جهان خود ساخته نیست این جهل نسبت به گذشته و یعص نسبت به آینده را برداشت لذا جاهلیت را به صورت یک تمدن امیر اسلامی در آورد که از حجاز شروع شد به شرق و غرب را گرفت البته همه انبیا با همین دو انصار اصلی آمدن که گذشته تیره را و مبهم را شفاف کنند و آینده تاریخ را روشن کنند که هیچ تاریکی در آینده نیست مسئله برزخ و قیامت حق از روشن است و انسان به ازن خدا بعد از مرگ نابود نمی شود یک حیات دیگری دارد هم ابهام را و تحیر را و تیرگی را در آغاز این عالم برداشتن هم تاریکی را به ظلمت را نسبت به آینده برداشتن انسانی که بین دو نبش روشن زندگی می کند نه بیراه می رود نه راه کسی را می بندد نه جریان قضه و امثال قضه پیش می آید نه تحریم های ظالمانه پیش می آید نه تجاوز های ظالمانه صورت می پذیرد قرآن کریم فرمود خدا شما را زنده می کند یعنی این حیاتی که برخیا دارن در حد گیاه هست و یا حد حیوانی است این را به حیات انسانی تبدیل می کند انسان کسی است که مظهر ذات اقدس اله هست هرگز هویت خود را حراج نمی کند هویت و ماهیت خود را تاراج نمی کند به دست جهل علمی و جهالت عملی نمیشمارد انسانی که اونقدر توانمند است که زمان و زمین را در نوردد درباره گذشته اظهار نظر کند درباره آینده اظهار نظر کند معلوم می شود نه تاریخ دارد و نه جغرافیا تاریخ زمینی به زمانی جغرافیای زمینی به زمانی مال بدن انسان است اما حقیقت انسان و روح انسان که او میگوید چند قرن قبل این چنین می اندیشیدن فرو اندیشه درست بود فرو اندیشه ناسباب در باره آینده هم نظر می دهد این معلوم می شود که از زمان زمین گذشته است این انسانی که می تواند در باره ده ها قرن قبل اظهار نظر کند و در باره ده ها قرن بعد اظهار نظر کند معلوم می شود که محکوم زمان و زمین نیست این حقیقت انسان است و این مردنی نیست ذات اقدس اله روح را که یک موجود ملکوتی است به نمرکی و از عالم امر است نه از عالم خلق و موجود مجرد است نه مادی و یه موجود پایدار است نه از بین رونده این را به انسان عطا کرده است و انسان حقیقت او همین روح است بدنش عوض می شود البته همین انسان است با همین حقیقت در برزخ است همین انسان با همین حقیقت در ماد است منتها ابدان و غالب ها فرق می کند اگر نه انسان با تمام هویتش در برزخ هست با تمام هویتش در قیامت از بماندان رضا در سوره بارک انفال فرمون استجیب لله به رسول ازا دعا کن لما یوهی کن فرمود این دین آمده شما را زنده کند الان بسیاری از مردم متاسفانه خود را بیش از یک حیوان نمیدانند 
حیوان اون که نافع است بعد از مرگ سود نمیبرد اون که زیانبار است بعد از مرگ ضرری ندارد هیچ فرقی بین گوسفند و گرگ نیست نه گوسفند مرده پاداش میبیند نه گرگ مرده کیفر افرادی که در جامعه به سر میبرند و غیر الهی فکر میکنند و موحد نیستند خوب و بدشون خود را مثل گوسفند و گرگ میدانند اگر کسی خوب بود بعد از مرگ هیچ اثری نیست چون معاذ الله معادی در کار نیست و اگر بد بود معاذ الله هیچ کیفری نیست چون به زعم اینها بعد از مرگ خبری نیست اما در سوره انفال فرمود استجیب لله بدر رسول ازا دعا کم لما یحیی کم دین آمده شما را زنده کند یعنی از این حیات گیاهی به حیوانی که دارید به اون حیات عقلی که به شما داده است توجه کنید وقتی به اون حیات عقلی توجه کردید هم گذشته که دیگران تیره میبینند شما شفاف میبینید هم آینده که دیگران تاریخ و ظلمانه میبینند شما روشن میبینید نه حیرتی در باره گذشته است چون است علی قدیر به نام خدا که این نظام را آفرید و ابدی است پایان ندارد یه حقیقت است که علم عین ذات است حقیقت است که قدرت عین ذات است حقیقت است که حیات عین ذات است حقیقت است که بدیل و مسیل و عدیل ندارد لا شدیک له نسبت به آینده هم همون همه شما زنده میشوید و در قیامت ذات اقدس الله همه بدن و اجزای بدن حتی انگشت و سرانگشت و خطوط ریز و درشت سرانگشت را زنده می کند و بر می گردارد. یک همچه است. اگر این عقید بود چه این که باید باشد و انبیا همین عقید را هردن گرشه بین انبیا علیه السلام در فروع جزئی برابر مقتضیات زبان و زمین تفاوتی هست اما مخالفت نیست اختلاف هست اختلاف چیزی بسیار خوبی است اما مخالفت چیزی بسیار بدی است این اختلاف را قرآن رحمت میداند اختلاف یعنی دیگری خلیفه و جالشین دیگری باشد اون لیلیان ها را خلفتا لمن اراد اند از ذکر و اراد گورا اختلاف شب و روز در این است که روز خلیفه شب است و شب خلیفه روز کاری که انسان در شب موفق نشد روز انجام بدهد در روز موفق نجاد انجام بدهد این اختلاف یعنی رفت آمد یعنی یکی جانشین دیگری لذا اختلاف لیل و نهار را قرآن رحمت میداند اون مخالفت و روبروی هم قرار گرفتن از کیجی بد است اختلاف جامعه هم همینطور است که هر کدام جانشین دیگری باشند کار نکرده دیگری را او انجام بدهد تا کاری در زمین نماند به هر تقدیر قرآن کریم گذشته را خوب روشن کرد همون به این که آسمان و زمین را حکیمانه و علیمانه خلق از سماوات و از پیچت ایام بعد فرمون سم از سماویل از سماویل به یه دخانون شما فکر نکنید که ما شمس و غمر و این ستاره های پرپروغ را با در و لعلو و مرجان درست کردیم بلکه با این مشت دود ذات اقدس اله شمس و قمر درست کرد علم می تواند کشف بکند که چگونه این امور پیدا شده است فرمود سم از سوا اله سماه و یه دخان و انفقال لها و لعزه اتیاب این آسمان است اون زمین است اون زمین را در دو روز خرد کرد یعنی دو مرحله از تاریخ آسمان را در دو روز خرد کرد یعنی دو مرحله داری. بین آسمان و زمین را که این بخشش در قرآن کریم به سراحه نیامده اون دو قسمت هست این مبدع شفاف و روشن است نسبت به آینده هم فرمود به این که شما خودتون را فراموش نکنید الان بسیار از مردم غرب گرفتار خود فراموشی هن. خودشون را به تاراز گذاشتن هویتشون را حراش کردن فرمود ذات اقدس الا اینها را کیفری داد 
و کیفرش این است که اینا چون خدا را فراموش کردن انساهم انفسهم خدا اینها را انسا کرد یعنی مبتلا به نسیان کرد یعنی اینا خود فراموش شدن نمیدانن حقیقت اینا چیه وگرنه حقیقتی که درباره قرون گذشته اظهار نظر علمی می کند درباره قرون آینده اظهار نظر علمی می کند معلوم شد نبش گذشته و آینده را زمان و زمین را زیر پا دارد نه خودش زمینی است نه خودش زبانی موجود است مجرد یه همچون موجودی مرگ ندارد مرگ مفارقت روح از بدن است نه زبان روح ما هستیم که هستیم آینده شفاف روشنی داریم هر کاری که کردیم ثابت است و روشن است برای ما که موجود ابدی هستیم به عزد خدای زبان آینده شفاف است آینده تاریخ نیست برای ما که موحدیم آینده تیره نیست میدانیم آغاز این عالم و سر آغاز انجام این عالم و سر انجام روشن است هیچ ابهامی در کار نیست اگر بار خار است به تعبیر جناب فردوسی خود کشته ای و اگر پرنیان است خود رشته ای بنابراین تعمل و دقت و بررسی انسان در بار خودش که روح مجرد است این بسیار از مسائل را حل می کند و سوالها را جواب می دهد. در سوره مبارک جاسیه فرمود حرف اینا سه زله دارد که هر سه زلش یا جهل علمی یا جاهلیت عملی قالو ماهی الا حیات دنیا نموت و نهی و نموهی و لکن و لدر همین سه حرف را الان بسیار از مردم غرب متاسفانه دارند میگن به این که جز طبیعت چیز دیگری نیست یک و ما هم جز زندگی و مرگ چیزی دیگری نداریم نه قبل از زندگی خبری بود نه بعد از مرگ خبری است این دو مانعه لا حیات و دنیا غیر از دنیا عالم دیگری نیست یک نموت و نه یا دو و اون که ما را آورد و میبرد غیر از روزگار و طبیعت چیز دیگر نیست و ما یحلق و نالت ده این سه اون چی که الان در غرب یا غرب زده ها مطرح هست همین سه امر است که در سوره بارک جاسیه ذات اقدس الا این سه امر را ذکر کرد ماهی الا حیات دنیا نموت و نهیا به ما یحلکنا الا در بعد خدای سبحان فرمود که این چنین نیست اینها اشتباه میکنن اولا باید بدانند که قبل از اینها خلقت بود قبل از زمان دهر بود قبل از دهر سرمد بود اینها بیراه می روند این طور نیست که از تیرگی شروع کرده باشد اینها این هم الا یز نون طبق گمان سخن می گویند نه طبق علم این هم الا یز نون برای همه اینا هدف هست برای همه اینا مهده هست مرگ و زندگی ریخته در بیرون نیست که نصیب هر کسی بشود این خلق الموت و الحیات هست موت و حیات هم این طور نیست که به اتفاق به انسان برسد یهی و یومیت هست مال هم مزاره که من ایل پرمود اینا آلمان سخن نمی گوید نظم مبدع خبر دارد نظم مبدع ساس نز پایان خبر دارد نز پایان ساز مبدع انسان را ذات اقدس اله تعیین کرده می کند پایان انسان را ذات اقدس اله مطرح می کند انسان هرگز نمی میرد در سوره بارک تور و امثال زاره اونها به نظام علیت آیات پرداختند فرمود مگر می شد چیزی که هستی و عین ذات او نیست خود به خود با بخت و اتفاق و شانس چیزی بی وجود بیاید با بخت و اتفاق و شانس چیزی از بین برود اگر موجودی هستی و عین ذات او نبود حتما سبب میخواهد اون سبب یقینا خودش نیست یقینا مثل خودش نیست یقینا 
حقیقتی است که هستی او عین ذات اوست ام خلقون من غیر شیء یک ام هم الخالقون دو هر دو باطل است نه بشر بدون علت به وجود آمده نه علت وجود آمدن بشر خود بشر است بلکه ذات اقدس اله است که اینها را انجام داده مشکل اساسی بشر خود فراموشی است اصلا خودش گم کرده چون از مبدع خودش قفلت کرده آینده خودشان در نظر دارد گرفتار جاهلیت شده است این جاهلیت هم باعث بیراه رفتن خود آدم است هم باعث بستر راه دیگران بنابراین الان اگر جهان غرب به این فکر بیاندیشد که انسان هرگز نمی میرد به نابود نمی شود آینده شفاف روشن خواهد بود انسان خود ساخته نیست بیا خود رو نیست از تیرگی به در می آید بین دو نور حرکت می کند وقتی بین دو نور حرکت کرد نه بی راه می روید نه راه کسی را می داد لذا ذات عقد سلام هم بود که اولین کار این است که خودشون رو فراموش نکنم این که در جوامع ربایی ما زیاد آمد است من عرف نفس فقط عرف رب همین است و اگر کسی این تازیانه الهی او رو متنبه کرد که انصاح و انفسه هم این فورم باید بیدار بشود و تدارک کند بنابراین ما میباریم بزرگانی که با ایراد مقال یا ارائه مقالت بر وزن علمی همایش بیفزاید بیشتر رو این جهت کار کنن که نظام بدون مبدع فائلی نیست این نظام حیرت آور عقلی جز مبدع علمی مبدع دیگر ندارد الان تمام علوم دانشمندان ما گرفته از نظام هستی است این نظام هستی آلبانه تنظیم شده است آلبانه آفریده شده است که مبدع علم همه اندیشوران علمی ماست فرون شخص آلم است یعنی چی؟ یعنی نظم بین این اشیاء را فهمید فرون گروه در ستاره شناسی آلم است محقق است یعنی چی؟ یعنی نظم علمی بین ستاره ها را فهمید اگه کسی متخصص در کشاورزی است در دامداری است در صنعت نفت است در صنعت گاز است و در صنعت دیگه است دانشمند است یعنی چی؟ یعنی نظم علمی این اشیاء را فهمید پس یه نازمی اینها را آلمانه تنظیم کرده است تا مشکل جهان حل بشود همونطوری که قرآن توانیست جاهلیت کهن را از بین ببرد میتوانه جاهلیت جدید را هم از بین ببرد و ما دیگه شاهد جریان غزه و امثال غزه نباشیم بشر با یکدیگر دوستانه و برادرانه زندگی کند تا بفهمن که اگر عدل و مهر و گذشت و برادری و برابری بوم می داشت و معتر بود جهان معتر می شد چین که اگر ظلم دود می داشت جهان تیره بود جهان تاریخ نیست برای که ظلم از اون جهت که ظلم است دود ندارد و اگر ظلم دود می داشت جهان مثل از جریان غزه و امثال غزه تاریک محض بود مجددا مقدم همه شما را گرای می دارم و از دستانکاران این محفل عظیم و باشکو حق شلاسی بکنیم امیدواریم روزی این جاهلیت جدید مثل جاهلیت کهنه و کهن از بین برود و نورانیت اسلام ظهور کند و انویه های ابراهیمی هم همین مطلب را بردن درست است که در فروات جزی اختلاف دارد ولی وجود مبارک ابراهیم خلیل هم راهی که نوح پیامبر آورد همون راه ادامه داد لذا در قرآن فرمود به انم شیعتی ابراهیم ابراهیم همون راه نوح را رفت چه این که ذات اقدس الله به ما میفرماد شما فرزندان ابراهیم خلیلی دین پدرتون حفظ بکنید و طبع و ملت ابراهیم همه ما بشر هم فرزندان یک پدریم که او پیامبر بود 
و انبیای بعدی هم سمت پدری دارند در باره از ابراهیم که ملت عبیک و ابراهیم ها و سماکم و المسلمین من قبل امیدواری می توانید اقدس الله روزی جهان را پر از عدل و داد بکنند که ما نزولمی بکنیم و نزولمی ببینیم غفر الله لنا و لکم و السلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکات I think uh, I can safely say that having listened to that for a second time, Ayatollah Jawadi's message rendered my entire introduction completely unnecessary. I think it is clear from that very short uh, excerpt that he's given to us of his, of his knowledge and his wisdom, I think that is a, just that illustrates perfectly the kind of scholar that he is and the kind of uh, domains of knowledge that he's able to draw together and synthesize and present in a particular context. And I think that's a mark of a truly great scholar, the ability to take that theoretical knowledge and bring it to the present day. And that really gets to the heart of what this conference is about. Um, you know, there's a, there is a hadith in which someone asked Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, about, uh, about a saying that was attributed to the Prophet. Fi ikhtilaf ummati rahmah. That in the ikhtilaf of my ummah there is rahmah. Now the way many people have understood that statement attributed to the Prophet is that in the disagreements of my ummah there is rahmah because ikhtilaf, one of the meanings of ikhtilaf is disagreement. But Imam Asadat was asked about this hadith by one of his followers and the follower asked him, he said, is this, is this authentic? And uh, Imam Asadat goes, yes, it's an authentic tradition. And then the follower becomes confused. He says, so if there is rahmah in the disagreement of the ulama, does that mean that then there is punishment in their agreement? Na'udhu <laughs> billah. Of course, you know, you know the, what the saying goes. If you put two, two ulama in a room, you'll end up with three opinions. <laughs> and the Imam Salih says, no, no, you've misunderstood the tradition. It is not what they imagine it to be. Because the meaning, and the Imam goes on to explain that the meaning of ikhtilaf here is not disagreement. It means coming and going in the seeking of knowledge. And he refers to the verse of the Quran which says that some of the believers should go forth to seek knowledge and then return to their people in order to warn them. To gain an understanding of the religion. And so Imam al-Sadiq explains actually ikhtilaf here means the comings, because this is another meaning of ikhtilaf, the comings and goings of my ummah in the pursuit of knowledge. This is where the rahmah is in the seeking of knowledge. And that is the real spirit of the conference that we are all participating in now. You have all come here to share knowledge, to participate in the seeking and sharing of knowledge. We have got scholars here who have come from all over the world. Yesterday, we had Sister Razia Batul Najafi, who joined us all the way from Pakistan. We have scholars from North America, from Europe, we have a scholar today joining us from Saudi Arabia, Dr. Hawra Al-Hassan, in this panel that we're about to begin now. And you have all traveled from very far afield. And you know, something, something beautiful happened here yesterday. I was just here at the front, sort of, I'd just come off, we'd gone on to a break, and I saw uh, Sister Fatima from Montreal, and we recognized each other because we haven't seen each other in years since I was last in Canada, which was far too long ago, when I was a much younger man. 
But her son, Mohammed, had been in the Hausa in London. He was in one of my classes. And so we knew each other through that connection. And as we were talking, Dr. David Coolidge, who is, who is sitting strategically behind the TV screen, but that doesn't protect him from me naming him and, and calling him out, he leans around the screen. He says, I thought I recognized that voice. And then he, it turns out he also knew Sister Fatima from Montreal. And then said, Suleiman comes wandering over because he's sitting at the same table. Sorry, I realize I've brought both. You're both in my line of sight, so it's really easy to draw you into my, my presentations. And then said, Suleiman comes along and he says, Salamadik. And then before I know it, Sheikh Shafiq Huda, who has come all the way from Kitchener, I mean, that is like the furthest journey of anyone in this conference. I mean, it's basically, there's, you know, there's Australia, and then just after Australia, there's Kitchener. From what I understand, that's, that's, that's my understanding of the geography of Canada. And then he comes over, and I suddenly realize, SubhanAllah, there are. There are people here from all these different places who have come for one purpose, for this conference, and they're seeing each other. And, you know, so many people have come up to me and say, you know, I haven't seen this person in so many years. And, you know, when I hear things like that, when I see things like that, I really feel that rahmah, that mercy. Because it's by coming together like this, by sharing this knowledge that we can solve not only our own problems as individuals, not only the problems in our local community, not only the problems facing the entire Muslim ummah, but the problems facing the world. And I think what Ayatollah Jawadi Amali said there, especially at the end, you know, about the importance of brotherhood, about the importance of justice, and the darkness we're seeing in the world today, the dhulm we're seeing in the world today, unfolding in front of us, while so many more powerful people stay silent, it does make the world seem like a dark place. But in this conference right here with this Rahmah, we're kindling a light. We're lighting a candle. We're building a fire to banish the darkness. And so please join me in expressing our gratitude to Ayatollah Jawadi Amali one more time with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And that reminds me, that reminds me of two things, two quick announcements. One, I got a message from Dar es Salaam last night. This is true, this isn't Kamal Qal. I actually got a message from one of the brothers in Dar es Salaam. I won't name him, but he said, we heard the salawat in Dar es Salaam. So you know, Dar es, Dar es Salaam are making it very hard for me to kind of create a beef between you guys. I think, is that, is that what the kids, do the kids still use the word beef? I, I don't know, oh dear. But to inaugurate the next panel, and in the spirit of building bonds across continents, because as Ayatollah Jawadi said, we, are, we can go beyond space and time. Let's send a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad that they can hear in Dar es Salaam. Sorry, I think Melbourne just called. They said, what's all the racket? So now we move in the spirit of that, in the spirit of this, this sense of community, we're moving on to our first panel of the day on God and society. And this, this really does build on what we explored yesterday because as we said in, in the activism panel, the last panel of yesterday, living, it's not enough for us to live in the modern world. We have to confront the modern world and ultimately we have to transform the modern world. And we are social creatures, we are social beings. We live in communities, in societies. And the four papers we have today in this panel really get to the heart of the ways in which we can aspire to do that. And I'm really excited for these talks. So first, first on the lineup will be uh, Sayyid Ali Imran, who will be talking about Muslim teachers' perceptions of tarbiyah and its implications for professional development. And you know, education is a huge, huge issue at the moment, educating our children, providing them with an education that is not only good in the secular sense, but one that promotes our values and our heritage and gives them a sense of pride and confidence in being Muslims in the modern world. And this will be followed by uh, Dr. Haura Al-Hassan, who will be uh, presenting remotely via video from Saudi Arabia. And she'll be talking about Ghurba and the emergence of a gendered pious consciousness in popular re religious novels by Arab women. And then we have Sheikh Vinay Kitia, who is a local of Toronto, you may have heard of him who will be uh, speaking about modernism, secularism, secularism, and Shia youth, an exploration of categories. And then finally, we'll be joined by Sheikh Murtada Ali Dina, who really wanted to be here, but 
in addition to wars and floods, there were also visa issues. So to, just to add to the tribulations. And so unfortunately, he wasn't able to get here in time. He really wanted to be here. And he sends his salams to you all. Uh, but he will be presenting remotely. And can we just recite a salawat for Sheikh Ali Dina, one of the heroes of this community? So without further ado, uh, Sayyid Ali Imran is uh, both the principal and religious director of Al Hadi School here in Toronto. And, uh, you know, I've known him for, I've, no, I've known, actually, I've known none of him for many years. We have a lot of the same friends, but I haven't seen as much as I would like. So this conference, you know, I joke that this, this conference is an excuse for me to bring my friends together, you know, for purely selfish reasons, to benefit from them. Uh, and so he has not only theoretical knowledge to lend to us on this, this theme of education, but he has practical experience. He's at the, at the forefront of building an education for our children, for the next generation of this community. And so I would like to invite him to come to the podium to talk to us about that with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Oh, I have a clicker. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad wa alihi al-Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, Ali, Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, dear scholars. My mind was getting ready for a break, <laughs> and then all of a sudden I hear my name. Uh, so, okay, so my presentation is on uh, Muslim teachers, uh, Muslim school teachers' perceptions of tarbiyah and implications for professional uh, development. Uh, just a little bit of context. Uh, three years ago, I returned back from Qom. Uh, I took on a, a local school project here uh, by the name of Al Hadi School. It's in uh, Scarborough, uh, and you know, next thing I knew, I was the principal of the school. So uh, that's been my <laughs> my role here in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I managed to connect with a lot of uh, you know specialists, experts in the field from our community, from the Ahlu Sunnah community. Uh, I visited Australia twice now, and I connected with a lot of uh, educators in the field over there. They're doing a lot of amazing stuff. Uh, but one of the things, you know, we brought to the school was this sort of a new vision, you know, of holistic education. This is the kind of, uh, you know, discussion that is prevalent in the field today, holistic education. I uh, have one of the books there by Professor Jack Miller who really popularized it in the Western academia. Now, when I came back from Qom, I had this idea of, you know, okay, teachers in Islamic schools, Muslim teachers in Islamic schools, part of their role is to give tarbiyah. And here in my mind, you know, tarbiyah, I have a very specific understanding of what that entails. And then when I come to school, I see all of these, you know, teachers from our community and I realize everyone has their own understanding of, you know, what that means. And I was like, oh, okay, wait, this is interesting. You know, how am I going to navigate this? So I wrote this paper, I presented it. Uh, in the Islamic Schools Conference uh, last summer in Melbourne. Uh, what this paper is really about is trying to see, you know, the different perceptions Muslim teachers in Islamic schools may have. Uh, and what does that mean practically for us? In our context, uh, you know, I was focusing more on our uh, particular school context, right? So, you know, most Islamic schools, faith-based schools, they, you know, they, they say that Muslim teachers are well-equipped to draw on the concept of tarbiyah, to offer this holistic education. And what does tarbiyah mean? Tarbiyah, you know, to put it very simply, is not ta'aleem. Ta'aleem is what they call uh, a transmissive form of educating, where you take, you know, math and science, and you kind of, you know, get those concepts uh, across, to, you know, uh, to the students. But tarbiyah is a lot more encompassing. It encompasses moral education, character development, nurturing, upbringing, and this is something that Muslim teachers believe that you know, they're equipped with this tool to kind of offer that uh, to their children. So therefore, it becomes necessary to figure out 
what exactly do they really, uh, you know, what is the perception that these educators have when it comes to, uh, you know, what, what do they mean by tarbiyah? And I have a quote here by one of the Spanish uh, educators. Actually, he taught in uh, Tehran before the revolution. Uh, and he says, you know, few would argue that the beliefs teachers hold influence their perceptions and judgments, which in turn affect their behavior in the classroom, or that understanding the belief structures of teachers and teacher candidates is essential to improving their professional preparation and teaching practices. So what did I do? I said I will try and look into some of the research that has already been done. Uh, you know, I shortlisted three or four countries, uh, Britain, uh, Zanzibar, Pakistan, and Malaysia, very specific uh, schools over there where, you know, interviews had been done by the, uh, you know, with the teachers, and really try to understand what do they uh, believe about tarbiya when it comes to teaching. So I used the framework by one of these Belgian, uh, you know, educators as well. It's, he calls it the personal interpretative framework. So what is this? This is just for the purpose of organizing the interviews. Uh, what it really is is that, you know, it explores the teacher's assumptions and beliefs through their continuous interactions with their professional working context. So you have one uh, you know, aspect of this framework, which is the professional self-understanding, which is how do teachers perceive themselves in their profession, in their professional working environment, okay? And then you have what they call the subjective educational theory, which is you know, what do these teachers believe works best in their working environment? So that's just the framework I use to, uh, you know, analyze and sort of organize the, uh, the findings. So the four schools I have over here are Britain, the Islamic Shaksiya Foundation Schools, uh, founded by Dr. Farah Ahmad. Actually, she was here yesterday. There was a second Islamic Schools Conference taking place here yesterday in Mississauga. I wasn't able to go. I sent my team, but Dr. Farah Ahmad was here. She's excellent. Uh, then you have schools in Zanzibar, Zanzibar, Pakistan, and Malaysia. So let's... For the sake of time, let's go through this quickly. So, the Islamic Shaksiya Foundation. This is, you know, a school initiative in England. Uh, they have multiple schools now, but it started off uh, as a homeschooling project, uh, a homeschooling initiative. You know, many uh, of us probably in North America have very similar stories. Concerned parents trying to come together, start some homeschooling initiative, but eventually it gets too difficult to manage. Correct. So they started off as that and then they implemented what they call the holistic Islamic education paradigm. It's a sort of curriculum that they use. Now, if you look at that uh, column, where, uh, the row that says professional self-understanding, this is important. The teachers uh, at, this, at this school or, or one of the campuses of this school are mostly immigrants to Britain. And a lot of their personal experiences of this fragmented identity, the identity crisis, you know, that they faced while growing up, uh, you know, kind of, you know, it's, uh, it's part and parcel of what they want to convey to the students. So their narratives of dissatisfaction with their primary education uh, is something that they believe that Muslim children, their children should not have to experience the same challenges of negotiating these two conflicting identities. So what do they do? They try to use the halakha format uh, as a, one of the pedagogical tools to inculcate uh, you know, sacred, spiritual, and transformative no uh, nature of knowledge, as well as the values, uh, cultural aspirations, and collective autonomy of non-Western people in realizing their collective goals. Now, pay attention. So children are taught autonomy, confidence to respond and communicate, uh, communicate, communicate, which teachers believe is an important aspect of tarbiyah, right? Autonomy. You won't find this when we do, for example, Pakistan, uh, when we analyze Pakistan. In fact, they will say, no, we don't want <laughs> to talk about freedom uh, and autonomy and all of that. Developing social relationships uh, are seen as fulfilling the objectives of tarbiyah and preparing students to navigate the world outside of their schools, correct? So I'm going to have to go through this a little bit quicker. I didn't realize the time flies a little bit quicker up here. So they also believe tarbiyah means to develop a systematic framework of thought, reflection, practice, and analysis. Okay, so the primary goal of tarbiyah becomes building better teacher-learner teacher relationships, which leads to nurturing autonomous and confident students, and it allows students to integrate 
rather than assimilate into the secular British society while maintaining their Muslim identity. So, you know, that's the uh, specific school in Britain. Now, when you come to Zanzibar, in Zanzibar, we looked at, uh, you know, this paper looked at three different uh, Islamic integrated schools. And these, the teachers over here, you know, there were three female teachers and three male teachers between five to nine years of experience. Uh, you know, one of them had an undergraduate degree, one female teacher had a certificate, one was A-level. So, you know, if you were looking at this from like an Ontario uh, perspective, not very, not qualified you know, not qualified in the sort of, you know, credential sense, but still, they believe that tarbiya is equal, equals guardianship and caregiving. So the role of a teacher is to guide or mentor uh, to the right path, to the suratul mustaqim. And what does this require from the teacher? It requires consistent observation of students' discipline, attendance, identifying shortcomings for the sake of improvement, but it also means it also means that the teacher must have accepted and mastered treading on the right path themselves. And they must have lived a good life themselves. Additional qualities like kindness and voluntary commitment and so on are also required. So that's the first aspect. The second aspect is of the caregiver. So a teacher ensures the health and safety of students while equipping them with the necessary skills and resources to develop into successful adults particularly by transmitting good cultural and moral values to them. So they believe part of their tarbiyah is to transmit the local culture, the local moral norms onto the students, something that you won't hear from the teachers in Britain. Like they actually don't want that to happen as part of their understanding of what, of what tarbiyah means. Right, so unlike the role of the halaka at the Islamic Shaksiya Foundation, the Islamic integrated schools practice the, uh, you know, prioritize their practice of imitation, counseling, monitoring, and the teachers see themselves as mentors, emphasizing the importance of modeling good behavior, uh, and so on. So let me, you know, quickly go on to the uh, schools in Pakistan. Now. So I have written here, look, the teacher is seen as, uh, sorry, just a, a final point on the schools of Zanzibar. The teacher is seen as an authority and a mentor, just like the parents, right? Maybe over here we, teachers probably say, hey, I'm not your child's parent. But over there they're saying, no, we are like your parent. Uh, and consider it the responsibility to, to transmit local culture, as opposed to the shakhsiya schools in England. Okay, Pakistan. This was a little bit disappointing for me because I'm from Pakistan and you know, I was hoping a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Six secondary schools in Karachi, two public schools, two private schools, and two madrasas. This was very interesting uh, for myself to read. Most of their pedagogies with respect to tarbiyah, so they did believe that yes, it is the role of the teacher to do tarbiyah, but their pedagogies were limited to lectures, Q&A, some you know, some storytelling and examinations. Uh, it doesn't seem too drastic from the transmissive approach of, of education. And all, even though all participants believed that the teachers have to go beyond the curriculum to convey moral education and holistic training, okay, but whether they did it or not, you know, that was up for, up for question. So in terms of the concepts that they wanted to prioritize was stuff like honesty, humility, kindness, and respect. But when it came to certain other values, like freedom, they were very open in saying that no, this is not a value that we want to promote, not because we don't accept it, but because it has been dominated by Western uh, interpretations. This is not a concept that we you know, encourage uh, and promote or discuss or even sort of value in our schools. So this is a very different understanding of uh, uh, tarbiyah. Over here in Canada, Toronto, we may have a very different conversation uh, with students at our schools. So this is something that is you know, kind of important to uh, uh, you know, focus on. They also emphasized poli policing student behavior with regards to manners and etiquettes. Uh, and you know, that's uh, so on. So it's all in the paper, inshallah, I hope. Maybe it'll get published. Uh, the details and stuff are in the paper. Let's go to the school in Malaysia. Now, when I did present this in, in Melbourne, there were some Malaysian uh, you know, teachers sitting there, and I was happy that they kind of agreed with some of the stuff I was uh, writing. The school in Malaysia were lower secondary schools, what we call over here middle schools, so grade seven, eight, you know, maybe nine. 
22 Islamic education teachers were interviewed, 9 male and 13 female. 12 taught in the secondary, uh, national secondary schools, 3 in technical secondary schools, and the rest were in religious secondary schools. 12 worked as the Islamic education teacher, so the Islamic studies teacher, uh, for 1 to 5 years, and the rest had 6 plus years of uh, teaching, so a lot of experience over there, as opposed to the other three, uh, uh, you know, schools. Most teachers had a diploma or a degree, and two even held a, a high school certificate, uh, a higher school certificate. Now, as far as their subjective educational theories, okay, teachers believe that tarbiyah positively contributes to the to the development of students, but they said it requires a good relationship with the students. And one of their complaints is that, well, there's not enough time. If we are coming to class and by the time students, you know, transition between classes and then the time it takes to, you know, get the kids to settle, the class is already over. All we've done is just taught the curriculum aspect and there's no actual time to do the tarbiyah. That was one of their complaints. You know, tarbiyah requires time and dedication and it requires teachers to go beyond basic responsibilities. This was a common theme in the Malaysian schools that some teachers were complaining that look, tarbiyah requires a voluntary spirit, right? And maybe some staff is not interested in putting in you know, extra time, extra effort, going the extra mile to build a relationship with a student. So they're like, hey, look, some of us are putting in the effort, but some of us are not. So you know, there's a belief uh, issue over here. Some believe that they are responsible for conveying the curriculum material only. And tarbiyah is the sole responsibility of the Islamic scholars. So in this school, there is a conflict happening. Some staff is saying, no, we should be able to do it, but it requires voluntary spirit. Some staff is saying, Aslan, what do we have to do with this tarbiyah? This is the job of the Islamic scholars. They should come and uh, you know, take care of this. So this is something that we covered. Now, what was the point of this for me? It was, you know, for me, it was a bit of a point of self-reflection that okay, if there are so many different perceptions of tarbiyah, and particularly in Toronto or North America, we have staff from you know, diverse backgrounds, diverse linguistic uh, profiles, diverse cultural backgrounds. You know, in, in a school in Toronto where it's so diverse, what do we do here? Because every teacher might come with their own understanding of tarbiyah. Is there a way to make it consistent and make it in line with the school's vision? So, I discuss in this paper that, look, there are certain implications of this under acknowledgement that people come with different perceptions. There are implications for teachers' professional development. Uh, I want to uh, you know, mention this quote here by another educator. Perhaps the most important single cause of a person's success or failure educationally has to do with the question of what he or she believes about themselves. So despite exploring these limited schools, the diversity and at times the contradictory perceptions and practical applications of tarbiyah held by Muslim teachers is very evident, okay, it's very clear. Uh, and, prof and you know, we also notice that the professional working context of each region, of each school, is also playing a role over here. So what do we do? I used another framework here by two other, uh, you know, professors. Um, of what they call, they look at teacher development from three different, uh, as three different categories, as knowledge and skill development, as self-understanding, and as an ecological change. I'll quickly shed some light on this. I have four minutes left. Inshallah, I'll finish it off. Teacher development for tarbiyah as knowledge and skill development. Okay, in line with the Islamic tradition, that seeking knowledge has to happen from the cradle to the grave. This is true for all of us. This is not something specific, specific to ulama. This is how your journey should be in life. Okay, from the cradle to the grave, Muslim teachers in Islamic schools, there should be no hesitation for them to believe that yes, there is a need for continued development of their own skill set and knowledge. Okay, but if you notice the schools that we looked at, many of the teachers lack formal studies, either in the field of education or in Islamic studies. So when you examine the relationship of the professional self-understanding of teachers and their subjective educational theories, it is very clear that tarbiyah is not perceived by a vast majority to be linked to any study of the traditional Islamic disciplines, nor a formal degree in education. Meaning many teachers don't believe I have to go to the Hawza 
or you know, do a, a degree from, I don't know, Islamic college, uh, from ICAS or whatever, to be you know, equipped to give tarbiyah. Well, tarbiyah doesn't have anything to do with that. This is what many of them believe, right? So, but I say in the paper that this may lead to the wrongful assumption that tarbiyah can be given by anyone without any qualifications at all. That's, not also, that's also not true. So, and then on the other hand, teachers from these different regions also demonstrate that formal studies do not necessarily qualify a teacher to give tarbiyah. So the opposite is also true. Just because you're qualified, just because you're OCT certified, doesn't equip you and qualify you to give tarbiyah. And you know, they generally perceive the prerequisite to, to give tarbiyah is the possession of good moral qualities rather than a degree or a certificate. So, this, so how does, it, how, does it, does it, how does one acquire this? It is not through formal degrees and certificates, but through the process of teachers receiving consistent tarbiyah themselves. So one of the ways I believe this can be done is by creating teacher development initiatives that focus on holistic training and the tarbiyah of Muslim teachers. We have had in the past some of these programs, like Islamic Teachers Education Program, in from Toronto by Professor Nadeem Maimon. In 2016, it you know it fell off. Uh, there is now a program in the uh, University of South Australia in Adelaide, uh, the graduate program of Islamic pedagogy. But I'm arguing in this paper that this is something that we need to look into to get teachers, uh, you know, trained in some sort of Islamic pedagogy. The second aspect is teacher development as self-understanding. Surprisingly, in these interviews, very little mention of self-reflection as a catalyst for improving tarbiyah was discussed. Right, Agha Jawadi's speech is saying that we are, for, we are people of forgetfulness, so you need to do muhasaba, you need to have you know, self-reckoning, self-accountability, which is part of our tradition, but unfortunately, this is not something that is even mentioned in some of these interviews. It is important for teachers to grow in their practice, self-reflect on their beliefs, dogmas, and limitations, as it's necessary to do that for further development of their ideas and teaching practices. You know, part of the way you can do that, for example, besides the basic, you know, self-reflection self forms, is by getting staff to write philosophy statements, their own philosophy statements that are, you know, living documents that they can work on, and you know, experts and scholars can even, you know, critique those philosophy statements to refine the teacher's own philosophy and pedagogy. And I will end off with the last uh, point over here: teacher development as an ecological change. You know, there are a lot of barriers outside of the classroom, outside of the school that can impede a teacher's professional development. And this is more for the stakeholders, the leaders that are in the community. You know, teachers in Malaysia were complaining that some of their colleagues do not share the same similar work ethics, while teachers in Pakistan and Zanzibar were complaining about poor pay and lack of resources. And, you know, the degree of collaboration amongst the teachers is not as good particularly when it comes to tarbiyah, moral education, and character building of students. So effective leadership in this regard, okay, effective leadership can help provide a supportive context for teacher development efforts, you know, and the supportive role of leaders towards teachers is something that needs to be looked at, okay. Uh, yes, so, an, so yeah, an improved ethos where stakeholders Parents and the community value teachers' role as a murabbi can be instilled to develop a more nuanced and comprehensive perception and pedagogy of tarbiyah. Inshallah, I will wrap it up right now. I did want to make one last quote. Maybe in the Q&A I can quote this. It's a very important book by a Christian theologian uh, and educator, Dwayne Hubner. Uh, these are his uh, lecture notes. Inshallah, in the Q&A, if I get an opportunity, I'll quote something from him where he's asking the school uh, stakeholders and leadership to really reimagine schools and reimagine teaching as a vocation, which is a call to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather than a profession or a job. Thank you for listening, and I hope that there was something beneficial from this. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Thank you, Said Ali Imran, for sharing your educational insights with us. I think that was uh, really informative and comprehensive and gets to the heart of a lot of the challenges we face in building uh, effective schools to preserve our values and, and heritage. 
And I'm sure we can pick up some of those themes in, in the Q&A, uh, inshallah. Uh, so can we please just express, before we move on to our next uh, paper, can we please express our thanks to Sayyid Ali Imran with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hora Al-Hassan. Now, Dr. Hora Al-Hassan is um, a scholar of, of literature. She was a fellow at the University of Cambridge, and she is now based in Saudi Arabia. Um, she will be talking to us about uh, Ghurba and the emergence of a gendered pious consciousness in popular religious novels by Arab women. And I, I think just to sort of give you a bit of context on this, one of the areas of Dr. Hora's research, which is really interesting, um, is on the sister of Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Bint al-Huda. So uh, I don't know if many of you know this, but uh, Bint al-Huda, Shaheed Sadr's sister, was also a great scholar in her own right, an extremely eloquent and well-educated uh, woman. And on top of that, she was also a novelist. So she actually wrote uh, Arabic novels and short stories as a way of conveying religious ideas and religious ethics to, to her audience. And this is something that uh, Dr. Hora Al-Hassan has touched on in her, her other research and her other writings as well. So I advise you to look at that, look, you know, to seek those out if you're interested. Um, but now, without further ado, I would just like to uh, thank Dr. Hora for, for joining us and for putting this together. And can we please uh, welcome her with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Salatu wa Salam ala Rasulillah. To discuss God in the modern world is, in essence, to discuss the meaning of modernity. Today's presentation begins with the premise that the novel is a very unique manifestation of European modernity that was imported in the 20th century to various non Western contexts, including the Arab world. The reason why literature specifically and cultural production like art and music more generally are not considered central in an understanding of the place of God in the hearts of believers and in their societies is because cultural production is seen as a byproduct of more important social, political and historical processes, such as the rise of secularism. However, today I would like to argue that literature has the ability the unique ability to shape perceptions of God in the modern world in ways in which other forms of knowledge are not able to do. And I think the power of literature emanates from the power of narrative and storytelling. So Iraq under the Ba'ath Party is the context I'll be using today to illustrate these points. Like other countries in the region, Iraq underwent a vigorous form of modernization from the mid 20th century, which gradually pushed religious and traditional communities to the margins. Some of these processes included the campaign against illiteracy, during which illiteracy was effectively eradicated, and due to which Saddam Hussein actually received an award from the United Nations. Another significant change was that for the first time, the state explicitly encouraged women to enter the workforce due to the economic boom Iraq was experiencing, especially in the 1970s. I would like to argue that very intense secularization processes pushed by the state actually marginalized religious women specifically and galvanized them to use the novel as a form of resistance against the secular values of the state as regards to women. Now, just for some context as regards religious fiction, because it's a very niche topic, religious short stories were produced in Lebanon as early as the 1930s, but fully-fledged novels only really appeared in Iraq in the late 1960s and were consumed across the Shia Arab world. These novels became so influential, in fact, that for generations of Shia women, including myself, a Shia from the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, our first exposure to novels in Arabic was through these novels, particularly the novels of the Shaheed, the Mata Amin al-Sadr, who wrote under the pen name Bint al -Huda. The plots of these novels were quite predictable, usually involving reform through marriage. So a male character is reformed through marriage to a pious wife, who tends to be the protagonist of the novel. 
The novels also tend to pit contending versions of womanhood against each other. So you have a woman that symbolizes the new Iraqi woman and then a more traditional character whose values are in conflict with her. Now, as the title of the presentation indicates, I'll be looking at a particular concept, and that of ghurba, to help me understand how these novels functioned in a particular society and how they propagated a value system that could be shared amongst traditional women, helping them to ultimately overcome their sense of ghurba. Now, from a Shia perspective, we are quite familiar with the idea of ghurba or being a gharib in the physical sense of not being at home. Um, the sense of sadness and alienation that this entails. But the origins of the word actually come from the word gharb, which means west. So that implies that this kind of alienation is rooted in moving westwards away from one's homeland. Now, early Shia religious fiction is interesting in that it is driven by feelings of not belonging to Iraq itself, what we call ghurbat al-watan, or the ghurba of the homeland, implying that Iraq had been changed so much by the onslaught of foreign ideas and the almost violent onset of modernity that it was no longer recognizable as a Muslim country and as such, its religious citizens didn't feel at home in it. We know that some traditional families, for example, felt that they could not send their daughters to state schools as they feared that they would potentially corrupt their children with the new values of freedom and socialism espoused by the Ba'athist state. Now, um, we see that religious fiction reflects a more nuanced view of the West with the mass exodus of the Iraqi Shia after the Intifada of 1991. And here the West is seen as a safe haven and a, as a space to potentially create that ideal Muslim ummah that is not nationalist in nature, but we'll come to that later. I have here an interesting picture from a publication by the Iraqi government during the 1960s. And you can see here the way the Abba, the traditional fe female attire in Iraq and in other places in the Arab world, is looked down upon and is seen as somewhat dated. So the, I don't know if, the, if it's clear here, but the picture says, um, the sight of an Iraqi woman in Abba is becoming something of the past. I mentioned previously that literacy rates plummeted in a very short time in Iraq, so the government exploited this new readership that was receptive to its nationalist propaganda. It therefore produced many women's magazines like this one, and sometimes even more explicit than this one, um, to specifically targeted at women, as well as translated romance novels from European languages. Now, it is in this context that the novels of Amina Sadr or Bint al-Huda should be read. The author of the first proper religious novel, she paved the way for others and made it acceptable for women to write. She was, of course, executed for her political and social activism alongside her brother Ayatollah Muhammad Bakar Sadr. By the year of her execution by the Saddam regime in 1980, Amina Sadr's first novel, Virtue Prevails, written in 1969, was already in its sixth reprint in nine years. So it was extremely, extremely popular. In the introduction to this novel, she says explicitly that writing is a direct response to the fear of the onslaught of foreign ideas and secularization, which has affected all sectors of Iraqi society. She also expresses her view that women are sort of the first line of defense and therefore more vulnerable to these ideas um, proposed by the state. And because of the rise in a female reading public and the proliferation of secular publications sponsored by the state, she felt that it was imperative for her to write back and to provide an alternative um, for young Shia girls. So here are some excerpts from the novel itself. I'm not a novelist or story writer, she says. I've never tried before this to write a story. Rather, what I present to you is merely one of many pictures of the society in which we live and an example from real life. Now, realism is central to the literary project of Amin al-Sadr. She believes that what she writes is a reflection, a real reflection of society rather than a sort of fantasy. Now the story of Virtue Prevails revolves around two maternal cousins, Naqa on the one hand and Suad on the other. Now Naqa, as her name suggests, means purity, represents virtue, and the latter Suad, whose name means happy or lucky, represents vice. 
The plot begins with the news that 16-year-old Naqa is engaged to be married to a virtuous man named Ibrahim. And her older cousin Suad is already married but is a kind of quintessential modern Iraqi woman in that she is not covered. She spends her days in beauty salons and her evenings in clubs. She also attends mixed parties and swimming pools and so clearly we have a stark contrast between the two women. And the, the, the thing with early uh, religious fiction is that we have a sort of caricature of women where women are not, the, the female characters are more, more symbols than real, uh, um, kind of real breathing characters. So aesthetically, from an aesthetics point of view, um, characterization is quite weak. This is an example of dialogue between the two uh, cousins. And so in chapter one um, of Virtue Prevails, Suad attacks her cousin Naqa's lifestyle, saying the following, and is this pathetic lifestyle you love and the isolation you have imposed on yourself part of your personal faith? So Suad reprimands her cousin for spending most of her time in the home and for not being ambitious enough to consider going to university. Instead, Naqa says she is enrolled in a segregated women's college where she learns to sew. She does indeed spend most of her time indoors and has very limited social interaction. And this, of course, relates to the idea of ghurba. And so this self-isolation represents a fear of contamination from the outside uh, community. So when Naqa asserts playfully that there are many women like her, Suad responds, what is this society? Why can't we see them publicly, these millions who share your views? This is a very important line because it highlights the marginalization of clerical communities and traditional families in Iraq. So we are looking at a time where the prevalent culture is a secular one and where religious people felt very isolated. By the end of the novel, Suad is eventually threatened with divorce by her husband, who is, who is the character who is reformed through contact with um, Naqa. Now, I'd, I'd like to make a very important point. I don't think that Bint al-Huda or Amin al-Sadr, the martyr Amin al-Sadr, um, was saying that women shouldn't go to, to university. Remember, this is the person who was one of the, uh, kind of was at the forefront of um, religious women's rights. She established a girls' school. She established several centers for um, economic empowerment. She herself was not married. Um, she was homeschooled all her life. So it, it's, the idea is, is that the novel is not to be taken at face value. It's intended to be a weapon that is used against a particular ideology rather than be, to be taken uh, literally. Now, I'd like to look at another novel just to highlight the diversity that we have in this particular genre. So I want to look at the book, um, a book by um, Khawla al-Qazwini, who is um, a very prolific and very, very um, uh, famous uh, Kuwaiti-Iraqi writer. So she's Iraq of Iraqi origin and before the um, borders were clearly demarcated, and she still writes to this day. Now, the book was published in 1993 and was banned, by, banned in Kuwait. Now, almost all religious female writers in the Shia community have expressed their debt to Amin al-Sadr, and we see this in the acknowledgments in this book, where um, Khawla al-Qazwini, at the beginning of the, um, of the book, acknowledges the debt, the real debt owed to Amin al-Sadr for being a trailblazer uh, in her field and for allowing, for making it respectable uh, for, for religious women to write novels. Now, remember this is 1993 now. Now the book that we just looked at had the publishing date of 1969 when Islamic discourses were not ascendants, it's pre-revolution. Um, so anything we look at post-1979, 80s and 90s Religious discourses here are ascended, and this changes the dynamic in the novel. So the book um, um, is very political, which is why it was banned. So rather than looking at kind of focusing on a dom domestic drama and kind of a, a marriage, which is the main issue discussed in most of these novels, the protagonist is actually a male. Um, his name is Muhammad, and he is a, a 
she calls them a politically active um, youth. What is very typical of all religious fiction is the lack of geographical context. So we have no idea if the story is taking place in Damascus, in Kuwait, in, or in Baghdad, because the stories are intended to be a parable. And as such, they are bled of their local flavor. And of course, there's the issue of censorship and the fear of censorship. And that's probably why uh, we, this, it, you know, all the characters are kind of operating in this kind of um, uh, strange space where we don't know where they are exactly. It's an Arabic country, but we're not really sure. So Muhammad is married to his very materialistic and shallow cousin at the behest of his mother. And he ends up eventually divorcing her and leaving the country because a conspiracy uh, is concocted against him at university. And when he uh, moves to the UK abroad, he marries a Palestinian woman who, uh, um, who was on kind of the same level as him in terms of dedication to the cause. And it's all these words, the cause, we're not sure what it is, um, uh, dedication or uh, engagement or what we call um, iltizam or engagement or in being um, uh, aware or all these words that are um, not given a very specific political context, uh, clearly due to the fear of uh, censorship. But Muhammad is eventually assassinated by unknown forces in or, or the intelligence of some country that we're not given the name of as well. So we do have this very clear shift from domestic dramas to very clearly uh, actively religious um, characters and it's kind of a reflection of the ascendance of um, religious discourses. So in the past, in the other novels, um, religious discourses are not ascendant and so we have kind of a uh, kind of a holding back in this, in this sense, in, in religious discourse and in this novel um, that's not the case. So um, I'd like to make some concluding remarks. So Ghurba is essential, in my opinion, to the formation of religious consciousness. So it's the feeling of being separate and of not belonging to a society that one deems correct, which leads to the formation of a new religious con con uh, consciousness and by extension, a new type of social configuration. And we'll find what we find a lot in these novels, especially the later novels, is that they encourage or look favorably upon marriages that happen outside the home countries between people of different nationalities. Because this is now the new religious ummah that is taking the place of nationalist bonds. Secondly, writing novels that express, writing novels that express ghurba is a way of combating Ghurba itself. So it creates a community of like-minded believing women who have the same or a similar sort of cultural background. It gives you a cultural reference point for women at that time. Um, uh, something I should have mentioned before, that the name Naqa from the, the first novel by Amin al-Sadr became so popular. Um, it became one of the most popular names in Iraq at the time. So the influence of this novel, these novels is, is real. So, so in this Iraqi case, we have a very specific case where we have a modern form or a genre, as we would say in literary studies, that is... A, essentially a secular genre that has emerged from secular processes. So in the Arab world, for example, poetry would be the, the genre of, of literature that is the most prevalent, and that would be the same maybe in, um, for sure, in Iraq and in other places like Pakistan, for example, and the Indian subcontinent. And now what we have is that the novel is being used to promote a religious ideology, which is the opposite of what it was intended to do when it first emerged. So what I would like to call that is using fire to fight fire. So now that the novel has been weaponized by the state and, and the Iraqi state is unique in the sense that um, huge funds were allocated uh, to the novel, to the production of the novel, particularly in the uh, 1980s with the advent of the uh, Iran-Iraq war. You had, in, during the span of the Iran-Iraq war, over 80 novels that were state-sponsored 
uh, propaganda novels. And so the obviously there was an awareness that this could be used to shape the minds of young people. So this same weapon is now being used by religious women and and it's interesting that it's religious women um, rather than religious men because you do have um, the emergence of religious fiction by men much later than by women so it was this idea that uh, reading novels is a women's women's pastime and therefore uh, the fear is, is that these young girls will be affected by translated romances or the publications of the state and so it starts by women and for women and so we have the novel being used as a modern tool for the propagation of religious consciousness. And that's why I find um, this topic so very interesting. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Horel Hassan, for that uh, enlightening presentation uh, on uh, religious novels in, in Arabic. And I think what was, I, I think there are a few points that are worth highlighting in that talk. Um, first of all, this idea of, of ghurba, of alienation. Now, while Dr. Hora was talking about the sense of ghurba for uh, Shia communities and uh, religious Shia communities, especially in the Middle East, in the Arab context, in Iraq, in Kuwait, in other places, uh, I think that sense of ghurba, that sense of alienation is something that we as Muslims and Shias living in the West can uh, relate to very strongly. Uh, you know, th this idea of not, not belonging, of being an outsider in one's own society, in one's own country, is something that we, we have all, you know, we've all experienced, whether we are, you know, whether born Muslims or reverts. And so I think, uh, you know, I think while this idea of ghurba uh, that Dr. Hora was talking about occurs in these religious novels from the Arab world, I think that basic feeling is something that we can all connect with. But the other thing that I think was really interesting, um, and I'm going to quote Dr. Hora, you, Hora's exact words, you know, fighting fire with fire, because there's this idea that the novel in the Arab world was weaponized by the state to impose a particular ideology on the people of that state. And of course, this isn't just something that we see in novels, we see this in, in, other, um, in other media as well. And for example, you know, we, this panel, we're talking about education. If you look at the history of education, especially in lands that were colonized, there is, there is a weaponization process there. I mean, in, in Canada in particular, you, know, you have the history of uh, indigenous peoples having their children literally taken away from them and sent to boarding schools in order to strip them of their identity. And so this is the weaponization of education. So you've got the weaponization of literature. And of course, you know, living the existence as we do, we don't think of a novel. We don't think of a short story. We certainly don't think of a school as a weapon. And yet that is how these things have been employed over the years by states and other sort of, uh, and, and other state-like entities to impose their, to impose an ideology. And I think what we can take from this, if we look at some of the, you know, if we look at some of the literary figures that uh, Dr. Hora Al-Hassan has discussed in her lecture, and also at the example, for example, uh, uh, Shahida Bint Al-Huda, it is possible to take those structures, to take those tools and turn them back against the oppressor. And so now we can talk about a liberatory form of education, a liberatory form of literature. And that is something that we need as a community, as a people to develop in order to foster that sense of religious consciousness, that sense of religious identity. In other words, we need to take these tools and use them to confront and transform the modern world, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, so can we just express our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Hora once again uh, with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And now we're moving on to the third paper of our panel today on God and society. And uh, now the, the scholar that I'm about to introduce, I've I, I met him many, many years ago when he was in London, and uh, you know it's funny we kind of we kind of took similar paths, but by diverging, and then we ended up you know meeting you know meeting again. And I think it's beautiful because you know uh, Sheikh Vinay Ketia is truly an unforgettable person. His passion, his energy, uh, his you know his drive. Uh, to consume and share knowledge is something that's really impressed me from from day one, uh, and just the just to see 
you know, almost take it, you know, when you, you don't see someone for a long time and then you see them again, you sort of notice how much they've changed, how much they've grown. I think, you know, w one of the great things for me, like Sheikh Vinay and I are of a, a similar age, it's just, just uh, it's amazing seeing how far he's come on his journey and uh, the things he's doing here now, not just, uh, he was, I believe he was uh, director of religious affairs here at Asadik School for several years, and uh, he's done his PhD uh, recently from McMaster. It's a fascinating subject, and also uh, leading the Shia Research Institute as its academic director. He's really a, an accomplished scholar, community activist, and all around great guy. Uh, so, Vinay, you can send me the check in the post. <laughs> And on top of all that, on top of all that, uh, you know, this is, this is his home turf, so he has home team advantage. So when I ask you in a moment, and hold your, hold your salawat, when I ask you to give a salawat, this is, you know, he is one, he is one of your own. So I need you, I need you to, to show, show, show Dar es Salaam Jamaat, those guys. You know, show them how much, how much you appreciate Sheikh Vinay as I invite him to talk about modernism, secularism, the Shia youth, and exploration of categories. Please welcome Sheikh Vinay to the podium with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Don't, don't, don't make me send him back. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من العين القوية الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين وصلاة وسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Yes, this is home. I know most of you. Um, we have so many brothers and sisters visiting from abroad and it's um, it's nice to welcome you all here to our home at JCC and, and, in, and in Toronto. Um, what I'm going to present is, is not, I, I mean, I chose not to make this kind of a laborious kind of uh, um, academic conference paper, but to make it a little bit more pastoral, just because in seeing the brothers and sisters that are here, you know, I, I, I chose to do that. And, and, and the topic that I've chosen today is Based on, uh, as Alexander mentioned, uh, I was the religious director at Asadik for many years. Um, uh, for about five years or four years as director, I worked there for another four, so about nine and a half years, I worked um, directly with, with, the, with the students of, of Asadik. Um, and I've been with the community for 22 years now. And I've, I've had time to reflect over those experiences, right, in, in being at the helm of the largest, probably one of the largest Shia Islamic schools in North America with 800 students um, and over 1,000 parents that I interacted with on a daily basis over a period of a decade. And to that effect, I'll quote a hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, where he says, Yabn Mas'ud. يأتي على ناس زمان الصابر فيه على دينه مثل القابض على جمر بكفه. That O oh, Ibn Mas'ud, a time of forbearance will come upon the people in which one's religion will be akin to a man holding a red hot coal in the palm of his hand. That, the, that religion will be something difficult to hold on to. And this is what got me thinking that there's a bifurcation going on very often between ideals as to what a pious Muslim looks like or what correct pr practice or orthodoxy looks like. And this is, tends to be the concern of the theologian or the jurist. And this is often described as what is, um, as an Islam which is lived according to a traditional textual understanding. And these are all the things that the ideal pious Muslim aspires to live by, shall we say. And realities can be thought of of what people actually believe. What do they actually practice? Um, and this tends to be the concern of the ethnographer or the anthropologist of religion. And I found myself over these years, over you know, this period of 10 years, 
stuck in this kind of juxtaposition between ideals and realities. Um, and it's, and we start asking these questions, to be a good Muslim and to live a normal life, what do these categories mean? And when faced with an opposition, it almost becomes a battle between competing cultural rubrics. So there, there, there's, there's, there's a tussle taking place between competing cultural rubrics. One is a commitment to autonomy, to this kind of absolute sense of autonomy, and the other one is a commitment to a scripture-based organized religion. These are cases when we hear, for example, you know, I remember when I was at the school, I used to hear, well, you know, boys and girls can't play sports together because Sheikh said it's not allowed. It's not, it had nothing to do with God. It had to do with because the, the person wearing that outfit said you can't do it. Uh, you know, and I always remember we'd have these conversations in staff meetings. If there's any of my fellow Sadiq uh, staff here, you remember, you know, and, and I always remember, it, it's not because Sheikh said you can't do it. The man that's dressed in this costume told you you can't play sports together. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with a deeper commitment to God. But it, 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 was, it was almost seen as if the man dressed like me is restricting their autonomy. And there's a deeper reason for this, right? And it brings us to something that Robert George describes in his book, The Clash of Orthodoxy, where liberalism rejects an authority that lies outside of the individual or what the collective self deems reasonable. So what are these competing rubrics? They are the orthodoxy inclusive of all of its allowances as represented by marja'iyah in the 12 Rashi'i context, and on the other side, new age liberalism. It is so ubiquitous that it is not even named. What makes this so interesting is that New Age liberalism, which I will define shortly, is so ingrained within the social consciousness of youth and a portion of parents that it needs to be unpacked and identified in its parts. Liberalism is what religious tradition was in Western Atlantic states, perhaps prior to the Second World War in the sense that Christianity informed so many aspects of Western social existence, that it was not something which needed to be found or defined. We cannot understand the experience of youth unless we understand the social and political philosophies that shape their worldviews and self-perception, even if they themselves don't understand what these are. This is something that Shahid Mutahari pointed to, I remember reading uh, an Arabic translation of some of his lectures called Al Imdad Al Ghaybi Fi Hayat Al Bashariya. This was, of course, written years and years and decades ago, where he talks about this 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 crisis within within human beings, um, and and it's and and he talks about the foundational departure from which people build their world views. And I've always been very interested in this, right? So when I would sit with a youngster who would come to see me. And they would say, you know, I'm having this problem. I have this girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever the situation is, uh, you know, um, and, and, you know and, and I just find this is too limiting, this is too limiting, this is too limiting. I would want to understand their foundational point of departure. Where are they coming from? Where is the root of their problem? Rather than opening up a risala amaliya and reading to them, parroting to them a fatwa of why something is wrong, I want to understand the point of departure what philosophies have informed their life. Then I would go a step further and I would meet their parents. And I would ask their parents the same question. And the parents would look at me blank faced. Because as I said, liberalism is so ubiquitous that Muslims have consumed it entirely that they don't even understand what it is. And this new age liberalism, liberal secularism, or postmodernism forms the bedrock of nearly every outlet of human interaction. Hospitals, schools, entertainment, politics, and so on. It is no longer the proverbial elephant in the room, but it is a de facto position that most non-Muslims and many Muslims have, have, have uh, adopted to or adapted to and simply live without even realizing it. Liberalism is a commitment to liberty from Latin. Liber or liber, free. Firstly, there's a categorical rejection of all sources of authority outside of the individual or what is known as a collective self. 
as a basis of morality and social political organization. In this regard, I have to say, you know, be very upfront, I've been very much inspired by two figures in my life. One is a man that I met uh, five or six years ago. His name is uh, Dr. Abdul Hakim Jackson. He's a, he's a brother from California, and I had the honor to meet him when he was a visiting professor at McMaster University. I'll share this story, a little short story with you. Dr. Jackson was visiting here, Abdul Hakim Jackson, an incredible scholar for those who know who he is in the Muslim community. He was a visiting professor at McMaster, and I remember the uh, chair of the, 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 the graduate secretary called me, Doreen Drew, and says, Vinay, are you on campus today? I said, no, I'm not on campus. He's like, but Dr. Jackson is here, and no one has signed up to meet him. He's literally sitting in his office all by himself. We brought him in as a visiting professor. Go and see Dr. Jackson. I'm like, I didn't really know who Dr. Jackson was at that time. I had no idea he's a larger than life figure. I believe he led the prayers on Muhammad Ali, right? I had no idea who this man was. He's an African-American uh, convert and, and a great scholar. He's a professor, at, I think, at the University of California. And uh, I go to meet him, and we just hit it off right away. And we started talking, and I started reading his works, and I just want to give a shout out to him. Just the ideas that I'm bringing here are not necessarily my own. I've been inspired by him. And then secondly, not directly by Charles Taylor, the Catholic philosopher. Um, and I've been informed by both of these people um, in this regard, um, in understanding and trying to you know, grapple with this idea that this 17th, 18th, 17th to 18th century movement was a rejection of the church, firstly Catholic, then any institutionalized religious authority. So first they started with the Catholics, and they said, we're gonna deal with you first. And then following the Catholics, it goes to any institutionalized religious authority. As Kant once said, have the courage to use your own reason. I have that in, in air quotes, I'm being facetious. Today, our youngsters are exposed to what was once a fringe academic and philosophical supposition which grew out of the European Enlightenment and Reformation. As Charles Taylor explains in the malaise of modernity, in his Massey lectures, these philosophies began just as that, only to eventually alter the entire ecosystem of the Western Atlantic social and religious life, whose prophets are the likes of Immanuel Kant, Nietzsche, Derrida, and Michel Foucault. This resulted in a post-1950 conception of authenticity and fulfillment, which was anthropocentric and self-determining, which is not rooted in any metaphysical framework in which Allah is beauty and loves beauty. Hence, because he determines what is authentic and beautiful, if this was to be accepted, then it is done so within a self-fulfilling framework, which states, which states to each is their own, my God and your God, as it is said. Or think of it this way, as Rousseau described morality as being following the voice of nature within us. You see, we have to understand how loaded these comments are. Our kids go to these secular schools where they spend eight hours a day, and then they go to university, and they become so-called intelligent people, and they're taught following the voice of nature within us. And they end up looking up to these people as if they're some kind of semi-pseudo-prophets. I'll call them pseudo, but as some kind of semi-prophetic figures. And what they don't understand is what they're really digesting is an unlimited pluralism within the limits of, an, of a prescribed political order. It's an unlimited form of pluralism within the limits of a political order, as Charles Taylor describes in the secular age. Now, how does this play out as an educator, or at least, I mean, before I went on full-time into academia, as someone that was, you know, really active within the community, how does this play out? Simply put, it plays out by over my 10 years, and this is not reflective on the school, this is just a society in general, right? It's not about the school, it's about society in general and our community in general. Every year I would see more and more individuals, uh, both in the Sunday school and the school, so I'm not, as I said, it's not about the school in particular, um, accepting certain ideas that were an anathema to Shia and Muslim consciousness earlier. So for example, this whole issue of alternative lifestyle or whatever people want to call it, quote unquote, you know, it was a fringe element. And then year after year, I would see more and more people talking about it, loving it, accepting it, whatever, whatever. And I remember I was in a Sunday school classroom, not naming, we have multiple Sunday schools in the city, so not naming a particular Sunday school. And the, the discussion of this so-called lifestyle came up. And unfortunately, in many of our schools, the teachers are not qualified. So the teacher that was teaching it was saying, no, we love everyone and all this hippity-da, whatever, you know, uh, kumbaya attitude. 
And, and um, the students got confused. My brother comes to me and says, bro, we have a problem. Like we have these 16, 17 year olds that are like totally down with it. They're just like vibing with this mentality, you know? And the teacher's just like, yeah, you know, just love, love, love and peace, right? That's what it's all about. As I said, this whole notion of unlimited pluralism within the limits of a political order. So he comes to me and I say, okay, fine, let's have a meeting. I'll have to meet the students. So we had a meeting with all the students and I started explaining to them, and I was very naive at this point. This was years ago, I was a very naive, um, naive person who lived in my books, didn't really understand there's ideals and then there's a reality of what people actually believe. And I came in all, you know, heavy, heavy hitter, you know, oh, this hadith, the eye of Lu, the Komelu, this, that, this, that. And students were quiet and say anything. This is years ago, I learned my lesson <laughs> about the difference between ideals and realities in, in religion. And uh, I didn't have much to say after I asked my friend, I said, you know, how was it received and stuff? And they said like, oh, they really, Sheikh, like it didn't go off so well. They kind of feel like there's a lot of hate out there and we just gotta love everyone and, and you know, like, and it was just this whole notion, and I was, quote, I was just simply quoting verses of the Quran and Hadith, and I really thought that would be sufficient. I really thought that would just be enough. Like, قَالَ رَسُولُ قَالَ اللَّهِ قَالَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ If you love God and you love, إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُونَ اللَّهِ فَتَبِعُونِ If you love Allah, then follow me, and God shall love you and forgive you. I thought this, this is enough there. But it wasn't enough, because like 75% of the class just continued in this, this whole idea that no, we have to identify with this group because they're oppressed. So we have to be with them, we have to stand with them, we have to go to their marches, and we have to stand by their rights because they love us. So this was an example of how I got shocked that there's a reality and then there's books. Then another example of this is what I call hypersexuality in the Muslim community. So when I first started out, I mean, I've been, I've been around the block, I mean, in terms of dealing with the community across the world. When I started out, let's say 10, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I, you know, the sexuality was like, let's say 10, uh, uh, you know, people were like 15, 16, you hear about things. Then it started getting like earlier and earlier. Every year I would be getting reports of like 10 year olds, 11 year olds experimenting, 11 year olds watching pornography, I was just like, what is going on? Like, it's just degrading. It's going down and down and down and down. And I don't know now, maybe grade three, who knows? God forbid, na'udhu billah. And I started asking my question, like, but no, but our religion's the best. Why aren't we doing anything about this? We have a problem. We have the best religion and we have all these ayatollahs and, and they have so many books they've written and people who have come from Iran and Iraq and they're, you know, they're all like, you know, they've got all these ijazas and all this stuff. They're all like brimstone. They're all fired up, but yet the kids are still engaging in sexual activity at the age of 12. And it's getting worse and worse. So the people in the turbans maybe aren't doing the right job, including myself, first and foremost, at the front of that, of not doing the right job, perhaps. I started thinking more deeply and then I met Dr. Jackson. And he says, brother, you're looking at it the wrong way. And I said, Dr. Jackson, how am I looking at it the wrong way? He says, you have to understand their point of departure. You're treating the symptom. You have to understand what is the core of their heart and their mind. I said, Dr. Jackson, tell me more. This is an honor, like I spent like two, three days with Dr. Abdul Hakim. I didn't know who he was at that time. He's such a famous, one of the most famous Muslim thinkers in the United States. And so we're out for Philly cheesesteak with Dr. Jackson. And I'm like, tell me more, like how do you raise your kids in today's world? He says, I wrote a book for my daughter. She's 16 years old. I said, amazing, what's in the book? He says, we're covering the ahkam of wudu at the moment. I said, okay. But he's like, for the first 50 pages of the book, are about the pitfalls of neoliberalism. The first 50 pages, now I'm on wudu and I'm not, the rest fits in. Because I wanted her to have a point of departure in her life, to understand the bankruptcy of this vacuous, nihilist filth, which is this, you know, idea of unlimited pluralism. 
Not to say that Islam, as he's written extensively, I don't want to misrepresent his ideas, he's written extensively on Islamic secularity and all of that. Not that Islam, not that Islam rejects secularism, no. But here we're talking about something else. I suggest you look at his article called The Effects of Atheism on the Muslim Mosque. Please take a look, everyone, you can go and look at it. It's a very important article. So then I started realizing maybe I got it wrong. I need to readjust the way I approach these issues. So I started reading Charles Taylor. I started reading Guy Eaton. I started reading William Chittick. I started reading Hossein Nasser, although they're all different in their own ways. I started reading, of course, Dr. Jackson's works and others. And I started coming to a deeper understanding myself, this my own personal journey as both an educator and someone that, that wants to learn more. And I had to confront certain realities in front of me in order to, in order to, to understand that. Because often we would get frustrated, well, why do people have a mediocre or apathetic attitude towards ulama? Where does that come from? Why so apathetic? Why so mediocre? I remember once I was in Chicago, at a masjid in Chicago, and it was the month of Ramadan, and we, the salah was finished, and you know, everyone comes and shakes the hand of the sheikh. You know, the, the men come up and shake his hand after. And only a few came, everyone else kind of ran off. And iftar was already, the people already had their iftar. I understand if they're hungry. Everyone ran off. And the sheikh turned to them and says, to all the fathers, if you taught your children to respect ulama, then they would have come and shake my, shook my hand. And he told them all. But my point is that that mediocre or apathetic attitude comes from a specific place. It's deeply rooted, and it has causes and reasons for it. And we need to understand that, and, and, and we need to understand what is the God that is worshipped by such individuals. What does that God look like? There's a very good book I would suggest, again, it's called God is Not Nice. I forget that, Lehner, L-E-H-N-E-R? It's a very interesting book. It's a provocative book. It's called God is Not Nice. And in that book, the introduction, it's written by a Christian author. He talks about this, you know, this, this idea of, of, of having religion without any responsibility or consequences. And he says that the, the, the God that is worshipped of this is nothing but a vending machine Walmart God. You get what you want from him, and you get what you want from him. And he loves you unconditionally always, even if your worship is so selective and self-centered and based completely on your own maslaha and your own needs. It's not transformative. It's not provocative. It's self-serving. So often worship can be misconstrued <laughs> to be worshiped towards this false god as opposed to the God of the Quran and the Sunnah, which I think would be the same God which we share, which Ayatul Jawadi mentioned with the other Abrahamic faiths. And this is very important to keep in mind. Like I said, I wasn't planning some complex academic speech. I, I really wanted to deliver this because the topic is on God in the modern world. And we need to contemplate over root causes. And that's where the study of intellectual tradition, the history of ideas, in my humble opinion, becomes quite important. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Sheikh Vinay, for that uh, provocative and uh, Timely presentation. I think uh, I think Sheikh Vinay managed to tie together a number of strands there, and again, it links to I think it links to both of the previous papers on this panel. You know, and this idea of uh, secular education, secularization, and sort of being being taught 
almost to expect that religion should serve should serve our needs in a very sort of materialistic sense, that religion should make it, you know, religion should be happy. Um, you, I, I love the phrase that you used, Sheikhna, which was a Walmart vending machine sort of God. And it reminds me of a phrase that I heard somewhere else. I can't remember who said it, but, he, it, but it was a nice turn of phrase as well, that instead of theism, we have therapeutic deism, in that God, and by the way, deism, so deism, theism, so theism is like the God of the Abrahamic faiths, Deism, you know, deus is like the sort of idea of a, oh, I believe in a higher power, you know? And so this idea of, um, uh, this idea of sort of therapeutic deism is that religion should make me happy, not in the sense, not in the sense of the Aristotelian eudaimonia, you know, the idea of a life well lived, a, you know, or what we would say, a nafs al in the Islamic tradition, you know, the content, the soul at peace, the contented soul, but happy in the sense of, it should make me feel good about myself all the time. You know, it should give me that, that, that rush of, you know, endorphins, just, you know, it's, it's an experience. Um, so it's a very sort of self-centered thing, and I think that's something that, and I, I love the sort of theoretical framework you put that in, you know, referencing Charles Taylor, and also, of course, the works of uh, Professor Jackson. And I think, um, you know, I, uh, I think actually the, the book you mentioned, well, God is not nice, I'm gonna read that. I like, it sounds very ash actually, very ash dangerously close to ash but I like the title. And actually, that was something that um, I think Adam Kaku and I were talking about the other day, sort of this idea of like, well, why is God so mean, man? You know, why does he, why, why is he so vengeful? And so I think that's something, something worth pondering on. Anyway, we're short of time, so I'm going to move on to our, our final paper of, the, uh, of, of this panel. And that is going to be delivered by uh, Sheikh Dr. Murtada Ali Dina. And, um, now, I've introduced Sheikh Ali Dina several times in my career at conferences, and I have to say, again, like, um, like uh, Said Rizvi, Sheikh Ali Dina was one of those speakers that I encountered uh, in my younger days, so not so long ago, no, actually very, very long ago, um, you know, when, when I was looking for resources in English on, uh, on Islam and especially on the Quran, and I remember coming across some of Sheikh Ali Dina's lecture series on alislam.org and just devouring some of his, his Ramadan lectures, some of his Muharram lectures. And, uh, you, know, when I, you know, when I think of Sheikh, Sheikh Ali Dina, I think of someone who has this deep love for the Quran and this, also this deep love of conveying the message of the Quran to others. And he's very, he's very effective in how he does it. You know, he, you know, he doesn't, he, he, he actually is just, he's so calm, you know, when he's speaking. I know I was just talking about therapeutic deism, but it feels good listening to Sheikh Ali Dina talk about the Quran. And he manages to beautifully illustrate its, its subtleties and its meanings. And I think, you know, we referenced Charles Taylor, you know, uh, a secular age. You know, I think we need to ask ourselves, what does it mean to read the Quran in a secular age, in an age of the modern jahiliya or the modern ignorance that Ayatollah Jawadi referenced at the beginning of uh, today's program? And so without further ado, I would like to introduce um, uh, Sheikh Ali who's really a treasure of the community. Uh, he'll be presenting via video. And so can I ask us all to welcome him uh, with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين respected scholars, elders, guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. With warm greetings and salutations from the proximity of Amirul Mu'mineen, Mawla al Muwahideen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhim salam I share with you message of greetings and benedictions and salutations. And I would like to begin with inspiration from the guidance of Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam regarding the presence of God in the modern world. In one of the sermons recorded in Nahjul Balagha, Hazrat says, Alhamdulillah, 
الحمد لله الذي بطن خفيات الأمور ودلت عليه أعلام الظهور All praise belongs to God and God alone who knows the secrets of everything and every affair and everything which is manifest indicates and proves his presence and existence and then after a phrase he continues sabaqa fil uluwi fala shay'a a'la minhu exalted is he in his loftiness that there's nothing loftier than him wa qaruba fid dunuwi fala shay'a aqrab minhu and so close is he in proximity there is nothing closer than him to everything fala isti'la'uhu ba'adahu an shay' min khalqi wa la qurbuhu sawahum fi al neither is his loftiness the cause of his distance from his creation nor is his closeness to his creation equivalent to him being the same as his creation in terms of physical being and limitations such a being who is high and low and in his highness he is not far and in his closeness he is not equal to his creation this unlimited infinite all perfect being is difficult to comprehend lam yuttali al uqul ala tahdeed sifatih his unlimited attributes are incomprehensible by the human mind however walam yahjubha an wajib ma'rifatih by the same time humans have been created in such a way that they can manage to attain the minimum necessary comprehension of their unlimited lord فهو الذي تشهد له اعلام الوجود على اقرار قلب ذي الجحود he is the one whose signs are plentiful and all encompassing and everywhere تعالى الله عما يقوله المشبهون به والجاحدون له علوا كبيرا exalted and glorified is he from the false attributions made by those who don't know his reality may allah bless us always with increasing understanding of the all perfect being as guided to us by maulal muwahhidin the topic of our discussion is god in the modern world how allah addresses the modern world through his eternal message the quran essentially if god is above time and space then his message also will be timeless and will apply to all ages be it the secular age be it the pre or the post secular age The Quran introduces itself in Surah Mubarak Furqan chapter 25 Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Tabarakallazi nazzala al-furqan ala 'abdihi liyakuna lil'alamina nadhira Blessed is he the absolute source of all blessings plentiful blessings continuously flowing blessings and who grants us 
different grades of blessings, but one of the highest ones is the Quran, which appears to us in the form of the Furqan, whereby we can make farq and distinction between what is right and wrong and what is good and bad and what is true and false in our beliefs and right and wrong, in our morals and the do's and the don'ts in our rituals. And it is the Furqan which he has sent, the unique separator between truth and falsehood. There is nothing better than that. There is nothing equal to that. In هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوام. Surely this Quran, this Furqan, will guide mankind to that which is the most upright and the most righteous path to the highest truth. No other comparable scripture will have the truth of the Quran. The Quran will always be higher than the previous scriptures. And those ideologies and schools of thought that are not based on any past scriptures. The Quran will have the best criteria of truth compared to any other man-made thought. So this message which is eternal and which is the ultimate distinction, distinguisher and criterion has been sent down to God's best servant. نزل الفرقان على عبده on his most humble, unique, exclusive, devoted worshipper, the Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله. ليكون للعالمين نذيرا so that he may be a warner and one who alerts mankind in all times and in all places, for all times. And therefore the Qur'an will have a message definitely for our secular age also. Because it is from an all-living God, an ever-living God, an ever-speaking God, and therefore an ever-living message for all times. If we look at the different attributes of God mentioned in the Qur'an as the source of this message that has come down to mankind. In different surahs, Allah mentions different names. Tanzeel al-Aziz al-Rahim In Surah Mubarak Yaseen wal-Qur'an al-Hakim Allah describes this revelation is from the Almighty, therefore nothing is going to conquer the message of the Qur'an. The message from the Rahim, full of mercy and grace and compassion and love for the whole of mankind. Or in Surah Mubarakah, Taha, Allah says, Anzalna alayka al-Qur'an, and then describes it as tanzeelan mimman khalaq al-arda was-samawat al-ula. This Qur'an is a revelation which has been sent down from the one who has created the whole of the earth with all its complexity and beauty. And all the heavens, the high lofty heavens, of which the lowest, the seventh heaven, we are told, is the physical starry heaven. The six heavens beyond are beyond the visible physical spectrum. Or in other surahs, in Surah Shu'ara, in Surah Waqi'a, in Surah Haqqa, Allah says, this is Tanzeel al-Kitab لا ريب فيه من رب العالمين. This has been sent down, and it is full of truth. 
with certainty and no doubt at all from the Lord and the Master and the Sustainer of the universe. So different attributes of God have been mentioned as the source of this message. The Almighty, Aziz, the Hakim, the Rahim, the Rahman, the Hamid, the Praiseworthy. This message has got nothing but beauty which amazes mankind and therefore would be induced to want to praise the all-perfect Lord. So if we appreciate the source being the all-perfect being, therefore the final message would be an all-comprehensive perfect message for all times, including our secular age. Unfortunately, in our times, in the past couple of decades, there has been a movement to try to create doubts in the existence of God. Atheism has been there throughout history, but more recently a movement amongst the atheists became more aggressive and militant and began to attack belief in God in a way to show that believers are unfortunately suffering from a delusion about God. Religion is irrational in its belief. Religion, in fact, promotes evil and science cannot prove the existence of God and reason cannot accept the arguments presented for the existence of God. And these ideas and thoughts were propagated and many people were impressed by the apparent arguments being presented. Yet the Quran being a message for all times did not agree with these allegations being made against the deen and against God to say that religion is irrational. This is the Quran which talks about signs from God so that people may reflect and reason that they may ponder. Deen cannot be irrational if it comes from the Hakim who is full of hikmah and wisdom and to say that religion is the source of evil and trouble and tension and chaos and war in the world. Unfortunately, some of these ideas were propagated and uh, therefore found a ready audience to accept it post-September 11. Yes, there may be some who hijack the deen and misuse it and abuse it in as much as science itself can be abused. And that doesn't prove that science is wrong or it doesn't prove that deen is irrational and wrong and a force of and a factor of evil. The deen, the Quran is Mubarak, sent from Allah who is Tabarakallahu. Ahsanul Khaliqeen God is the most blessed who created the best of his creation the human being for whom he sent the most blessed message the Furqan and the Quran the Quran has sent a messenger who is Rahmatun Lil Alameen not a messenger of evil and war and to say that Science cannot prove the existence of God. Interestingly, there has been a growing number of scientists who have converted to faith. Um, interesting example is Professor Anthony uh, Flew, a British scientist 
who is an atheist, but later on in life, he converted. And interesting is the reason that he gives for conversion and belief in, in God. And the fact that he says that this universe has a beginning from non-existence, which is what Allah cle clearly mentions in the Quran that he's Fatir al-Samawati wal the one who creates from non-existence the heavens and the earth, Badi'ur al-Samawati wal who innovates and creates afresh without any preceding example, the beautiful creation. Flew says that study of science indicates that nature is governed by fixed laws. And the Quran clearly mentions Sunnat Allah. Allah creates with specific laws. And Allah has measured every entity in existence with specific proportions. Not a little less, not a little more, otherwise the system would collapse. Flu says that life with all its complexity began from non-living matter. And then he talks about the anthropic principle whereby it seems that these constants in the physical laws, biological laws, chemical laws which govern the universe and the appearance of life and the continuity of life, these constants had there been a slight change in their measurement, a little more or a little less, and life would have become impossible. The simple example being that if the earth was a little closer to the sun, we would have fried in the heat like what is happening on Venus and Mercury. And had we been, had the Earth been a little further away from the Sun, and we would have been frozen as, as happens on Saturn and Uranus. The fact that the Earth is located in this Goldilocks zone where it's just the right conditions to enable life this is one example, but there are multiple constants which indicate that there is an intelligent mind that designed this. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to produce intelligent life. Interesting is what the Quran keeps on emphasizing, what the British scientists who converted to theism discovered is something that the Quran keeps on reminding the secular mind that in fi khalqi samawati wal ard in surah mubarak baqara and in surah ali imran and in surah jathia and other surahs wa sakhkhara lakum al layla wal nahar wal shams wal qamar wal nujum musakharatun bi amrihi in fi dhalika la ayatin liqawmi yaqilun a lot of physical phenomena are mentioned and an invitation and a challenge is given to the secular mind come and study and see the beautiful design the complex design which cannot be possible just by chance or by blind forces of matter. Interesting is that Allah says in these phenomena there are signs for that tribe of people, for that community of people who reflect, who ponder, who observe Qawmin, according to one of the great professors of the Qur'an, he 
elaborates on this word لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ قَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ قَوْم from the word قِوَام uh, one whose whole pillar of existence whose fundamental core identity is there are people who use their aql and fikr who ponder and reflect such reflective intelligent people will observe and reach the conclusion that this beautiful design must have an intelligent uh, designer interesting is what one of the scientists say that the constants that we know today the four basic forces that led to the appearance of the galaxies and the stars and the planetary system the four forces which physicists believe um, the force of gravity and electromagnetism and the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force they say in the past at the time of the Big Bang these four physical forces were merged into a single united force but as the universe expanded after the Big Bang and the cooling process spread these four merged forces began to separate from each other first came the force of gravity then the strong nuclear force and lastly the electromagnetic force and then the weak nuclear force split and interesting they say is that this last step the separation of and the splitting of the weak nuclear force from the electromagnetic force this split can be recreated in the lab so in, in, in the most powerful man-made particle collider physicists can achieve and regenerate the amount of energy which is needed to recombine these forces into a single weak nuclear electromagnetic combined electro weak force and interesting they say that every time the forces the four merged forces divided the radic the, the cosmos underwent a radical phase transition with new particles and new forces now the interesting conclusion is this if these two forces had not split the electromagnetic and the weak nuclear force life as we know it today which depends on electromagnetic interactions to glue the atoms together into molecules life would simply not exist what the physicists are telling us today is something the Quran has challenged the secular mind in Surah Mubarakah Anbiya Allah says Alam yara alladheena kafaru don't those who doubt or reject the existence of God and design and intelligence awalam yara alladheena kafaru anna samawati wal arda kanata ratqan fafataqnahuma don't they see how the heavens and the earth were merged and then we are the ones Allah says who split them apart and interesting after the splitting life emerges don't they ponder and reflect and realize the signs which are so clear for all to see the beauty of the Quran as it addresses the secular mind is that Allah understands the core basic longing of the human being 
without connection to God, without devoting oneself to a higher being, without submitting oneself in awe and submission and humility and love to the all absolute powerful perfect being man by nature is attracted to lesser beings to lesser entities and he begins to worship and to devote himself and to adore other entities the result of which is self-harm and self-destruction a beautiful parable in the Quran about the damaging effect of shirk and turning away from God and rejecting God is mentioned in Surah Mubarakah Hajj وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ the parable in the example the illustration of the state of mind and life of a person who rejects God and turns to other entities and devotes himself. Sometimes it's to oneself, the little man-made God in himself. If you turn away from God, the parable is like that person who is in a state of free fall. There's no control over what forces will take over. And the vultures come and attack him. And if it's not the vultures, it's the f stormy winds that can blow him beyond control in directions that he may not want to go to. And then he crushes and crashes and destroys himself. Let's pray to Allah that we get the tawfiq to be able to appreciate that the Quran talks to the secular mind and the secular age, be it the pre-secular, be it the secular, be it the post-secular age, and has a timeless message that touches our hearts and our minds and can bring about a transformation and an illumination and a closeness to God and a submission to God which will then become the means of our salvation and felicity. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Dr. Mursal Ali Dina, for delivering that really inspiring and insightful discussion of reading the Quran in a secular age. Um, you know, I... I, I think I, I think I should tell you by the way that that wasn't a live that that wasn't a live stream but that was it was almost live because he recorded that uh, last night after coming back from uh, coming back from Karbala he recorded that in a in a studio in Najaf and uh, again you know it just sort of underscores how much effort has gone into the production of this this conference that even our you know our speakers are even suffering to get here I mean some of the story you know it, over the last two weeks some of the stories we've had like as we're communicating with our lecturers about uh, their transportation arrangements wars floods cancelled flights visa issues you name it I mean there's there's so much effort going on behind the scenes to bring this here and even this sort of you know uh, Sheikh Ali Dina coming from Karbala to Najaf to record that we couldn't be more grateful so let's please show our appreciation to Sheikh Ali Dina and to all of our speakers with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Now we are running a little bit behind time, so in order to get the time back, now I realize we said that human beings can transcend time and space, which is great in theory, but I don't think we've reached that level of tajarud yet where we can just sort of, you know, have the whole conference transcend time. Maybe if Ayatollah Jawadi had given us another 15 minutes of video, I think we'd have all reached that stage listening to him, but unfortunately uh, we're still, you know, embodied spirits. So in order to uh, sort of make sure that we have enough time for lunch and salah, and some of our speakers also have flights to catch later. Um, what we're going to do is this. We're going to break now for lunch, which is going to be served downstairs. Uh, and then salah will be at about 1.30 in the masjid. And then we're going to reconvene here at 1.45, and that will hopefully get us almost back on track. And now as for the Q&A, 
what we will do is we will, Sheikh Vinay has kindly agreed that he will come on the next Q&A session, so the Q&A for panel two, and we'll make that a longer Q&A. Uh, and Said Ali Imran is gonna come back for Q&A number three. So if you have questions for Sheikh Vinay on, on his talk, or Said Ali Imran on his, they will be coming back, and they will be on panels two and three respectively. And also, uh, we are hopefully gonna be joined by Dr. Hora Al-Hassan on panel two as well. So if you have any questions for her about her talk, you can ask them then. Now, one final thing I want to announce to you uh, is about publications. So we have uh, two book, uh, book stands here displaying some of the publications from the Islamic Education Department. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough copies to sell with us, but there are QR codes there that will take you to the Amazon store where you can purchase copies uh, to be delivered to an address of your choosing. Uh, now, if you look at these books, there are, there are books on Islamic law, on fiqh. We have Sayyid Sistani's Rasala. We have Tafsir Tadabul Quran, which is a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, work of Quranic commentary. Uh, we also have samples from the new, uh, the new uh, Tawdi al Masail al Jami, or the comprehensive Islamic laws of Sayyid Sistani, which the Islamic Education Department are producing. And I believe that that project's being overseen by uh, Sheikh Mohammed Ali Ismail, who's here in the, uh, amongst our presenters. And it really looks fantastic. I mean, you know, it's uh, extremely detailed technical work. And so if you have any questions about that, uh, do check out the samples that are available. So right now what we've got from Toldi al Masal al Jama is just the first uh, two chapters, I believe, for you to have a look at. And if you want to know more about it, Sheikh Ismail is also here. Um, oh, and we have, a, we have a sample that I can hold up for you. So, uh, and here is one I made earlier. Or, well, one that Sheikh Ismail made earlier. I'm sorry, I should... Uh, I shouldn't take credit for that. Uh, but this, we have samples of these available for you to look through as well. And so this is Comprehensive Islamic Laws, an English translation of Tawdi al-Masal al-Jami, an expanded manual of rulings from his eminence, as Sayyid Ali al-Husseini al-Sistani, may God preserve him, translated and annotated by Muhammad Ali Ismail. Uh, and this is, and, and by the way, this, this booklet has been printed especially for this conference here. So it's a limited edition, which means if you get one, you hold on to it for a few years, then put it on eBay, you know, you can you, you can make back the gas money you paid to, uh, to to get here. So this is this is this is both an investment in your akhirah and an investment in your future. Limited edition copies available now. Okay. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, ask you all to go to uh, to lunch and then to salah. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salawat.